Too many wires? <laughs> if everybody can... <clears throat> If everybody can please grab their seats so we can begin. Can everybody take their seats, please? Hello? Everybody take their seats. Take, counselors, can you please take your seats? Thank you. Counselor Cheng, please take your seat. Thanks, everyone. I think everyone's uh, all, all very, ex if we can have everybody's uh, attention, please. This, this is what happens after you've uh, come back after almost two years of not having in-person uh, meetings. So uh, we're about to begin, please. Sorry, there's a lot of, I don't have a gavel. We used to have a gavel. Looks like there's a lot of wires up here. So we just, we need a gavel to start. There we go. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Councillor Gary Crawford. I'm chair of the Budget Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we do have quorum, and I'd like to call the first Budget Committee meeting uh, of this term to order, and I'd like to welcome everybody. I believe this is the first time in well over two years that we've actually met physically to do the budget process, so again, I want to thank councillors for coming out. It looks like we have all the councillors that we who want to be here in person. I don't know if there's any... Uh, uh, on the uh, camera, but I'm glad that I see a good representation of councillors here today. Today's meeting is being held with members of council and city staff participating both by video conference and in person at City Hall in committee room one here. City Hall is open to the public and anyone is welcome to attend the city meeting at City Hall today. Of course, it's being live streamed on youtube.com at Toronto City Council Live. I ask for everyone's patience if we do experience any delays or technical problems during the meeting. City Clerk has provided all the agenda, the agenda materials on the clerk's website at toronto.ca slash council. Clerk's IT staff are here for any members who will need assistance. Although we are meeting in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. First item, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you have an interest, please raise your hand to unmute your mic. Seeing none, uh, Councillor Moist, can you just uh, move that item for me, if you could? Thank you very much. Um, all in favour? Opposed? That's carried. The purpose of today's meeting is to hear an overview presentation from the City Manager and the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer on the 2023 Operating and Capital Budgets. The presentation that we are about to hear is now available on the Clerk's public website at toronto.ca slash council. Following the presentation, I'm going to open up the floor to questions from uh, councillors, uh, people, uh, councillors who are here and uh, we will make sure that the questions are only on the presentation today. We will have an opportunity to get into individual agencies and division um, budgets Thursday and Friday. Again, so the overall presentation uh, questions today. What I'd like to do is just give a brief overview of the budget process for this year for everybody. <laughs> So the Budget Committee is responsible for hearing public pr uh, presentations and providing advice to the Mayor on the operating and capital budgets and for making recommendations to Council on any operating or bu capital budgets in which the Mayor has a pecuniary interest. The Budget Committee will be making its recommendations at our meeting on January 24th. The detailed 2023 budget agenda, which includes all of the budget notes and supporting information from cities, divisions and agencies, will be published later today after we hear the overview presentation. The 2023 budget agenda will be published on the clerk's public website at toronto.ca slash council and more information can be found at toronto.ca slash budget. Budget Committee, again, will be meeting this week, Thursday, January 12th, and Friday, January 13th. That's where we're going to review the budget in more detail with all the city divisions and agencies. 
On Thursday, we're going to be re reviewing the budgets of community and social services, corporate services, infrastructure and development services, the accountability offices, and all of the uh, city agencies. On Friday, we're going to be focusing on the Toronto Police Service and the TTC budgets. Members, if you need additional information from staff that is not covered by the presentations or is in the detailed budgets notes uh, or answers that you may be asking city staff, uh, you will be able to request a briefing note. These briefing note motions um, we'll be dealing with on Thursday and Friday, and I ask that if you can, um, and these are due to councillors, probably more new councillors than some of the councillors who have been, been before understand the process. Any motions that you request, and if you can get it into the clerk as soon as possible, give permission for the clerk to uh, circulate that. What we need to do is ensure that staff have the, every ability to be able to get a brief note in the time required uh, between budget wrap or budget uh, finish of the presentations and wrap up. So again, if you can just provide that uh, brief note as quickly as possible to the clerks. Uh, given that the very short timelines between our budget review this week and our final wrap-up is January 24th, and again, as a repeated, planning staff are, are requiring all budget notes to come in as quickly as possible. Budget committee is going to be hearing public speakers next week uh, on Tuesday, January 17th and Wednesday, January 18th, and I'm recommending that the budget committee establish four subcommittees so that we can meet in two civic centres. On each of these two days of public presentations, uh, again, scheduled for January 17th and 18th of next week. And I believe we have a letter that I, we have to introduce. That, uh, if you can put that up. Members of the public can register to make a presentation of the subcommittees at City Hall in North York City Centre on January 17th and 18th. Uh, again, it will be at Civic Centre in Scarborough and Civic Centre in Etobicoke. These subcommittees will report back on their activities as part of the process. So in order to establish these committees, we need to vote uh, to, number one, introduce the letter and, and do another vote of adoption. So all in favor of an introducing this item? That carries. All in favor of adopting the recommendation to establish subcommittees of the Budget Committee to meet on January 17th and 18th? All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. And again, members of the public who wish to speak on the 2023 budget can register with the clerk by emailing buc at toronto.ca and choosing a time slot on either January 17th or 18th. After we hear from the public, the Budget Committee will meet again on January 24th to make our final recommendations to the Mayor and to City Council on the 2023 operating budgets. I'd like to thank city staff, particularly those in financial planning, for the resilience and the dedication that they have been doing to prepare this 2023 budget. As you can appreciate, it takes months and months of work, and they've been working incredibly hard behind the scenes for this presentation today. After the presentation, there will be questions from visiting councillors and committee members, as I've mentioned. Uh, please note that these are questions just on the overall presentation. We'll get into all the detailed questions on Thursday, Friday. Now I'd like to pass it over to City Manager Paul Johnson, CFO Heather Taylor and her team, and of course Steve Conforti with Financial Planning Services. Welcome and whenever you're ready. Just before we begin um, our financial planning, we'll be bringing down some physical copies for some of the councillors who may not, some, most of you are online, but we'll bring some physical copies for you to look at. Yeah, I think they're, they're bringing some uh, copies down, so it'll be here very shortly. You can go on, uh, get online to have a look at it online if you want to. Well, thank you, Chair, and, and good morning. Good morning to members of the Budget Committee and, and to um, councillors who are also joining today for the conversation uh, at this committee meeting. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with uh, Heather Taylor, who is our Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer, and Stephen Conforti, the Executive Director of Financial Planning, uh, to present an overview of the 2023 uh, operating and, and capital budget. As the chair indicated, uh, this is a process that takes uh, quite a while for us to get to today. 
Uh, the old joke is we get about one day off after the budget's passed and then we start working on the next year's budget. And it isn't far off. Last spring we began analyzing what 2023 was looking like and by the summer we were providing instruction to the staff in terms of how we could build the initial phases of the budget and then through the fall honing that to get to where we are today. And so in that spirit, I want to thank uh, literally hundreds of people across the organization who helped make this budget uh, uh, come together this year. Uh, particularly the members of the senior leadership team who have been working hard uh, throughout the number of months and they're here in person with us but then their respective teams in our service areas who are the ones who analyze uh, who look at ways that uh, we can put forward both the investments that are required to continue to keep this city moving and also the ways that we can ensure that we present a balanced budget so those efforts are uh, appreciated and uh, today you're seeing the results of uh, of that so if we move to the next slide, today we are presenting the operating and capital budget and we're tabling a budget uh, from an operating perspective that is just over 16 billion and from a 10 year capital budget and plan perspective, uh, just over 49 billion. Uh, this is a, a budget that is not only important to the day to day lives of Torontonians, but is critically important to the overall economic health of this province and of this country. The economic engine of Canada is Toronto. And so what happens and how we invest resources and how we continue to move this community forward has an impact beyond the borders of the city of Toronto. I will say that the 2023 budget presented some unique challenges that are different than uh, previous years. This was a difficult budget to come to balance, but today you are seeing a balanced budget. It was difficult in terms of all of the factors that were impacting how we built the 2023 budget. And we're ta we'll talk in detail about the impacts of all of those elements. But what was a bit unique this year is that there was this confluence of so many elements at the same time across the entire uh, breadth and depth of the work of the city. And so again, my thanks goes out to all of those who worked hard to determine how we could uh, ensure the priorities of this community will continue to be met and present a balanced budget. We did, through this budget, make sure that we could maintain frontline services and manage affordability. And that is always the balance between uh, what uh, increases in terms of uh, taxes or fees uh, or other rates that are acceptable in the community and are possible in the community, balanced off against what we need to invest in those priorities. We did, and you'll hear more about the priorities in a coming slide, we did continue to look at how we could make key investments in the areas that are important to Torontonians and are important uh, to Council and have been priorities of Council, not just heading into 2023, but for many years. And that includes how we move around this community in terms of our transit and transportation, how we continue to invest in housing across a continuum, how we uh, uh, invest in public safety, and of course, how we continue to invest in the infrastructure of this city. From a priorities perspective, these are priorities that we began discussing with the senior leadership team and with our respective divisions uh, back in the summer. We've continued to work uh, through these priorities and uh, working closely with the mayor have, uh, have adhered to these priorities as we come uh, to the tabling of this budget today. And so from the very early stages of the development of this budget, we did want to maintain wherever possible the frontline services that Torontonians enjoy on a day by day basis. And you see three examples just to, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, what does frontline service mean? But these are these front facing services that support people in our community that allow uh, those who call Toronto home, uh, whether that is uh, the place that they live or the place they do business or the place that they study, that those services that are really important to Torontonians continue to be there. We did prioritize emergency services and public safety, not only our first responders, but also the commitment of this community to what we call safe TO, looking at uh, community safety and well-being in a broader sense. And that includes uh, the groundbreaking work that we are doing with the crisis response programs that are seeking to provide uh, a stronger and more community-based approach to dealing with concerns and issues in various communities. It also extends to things like our cybersecurity, that we ensure that we are safe from the uh, provision of information and the collection of information that so many people are engaged with with our community. 
We did prioritize, again, how people move around this community, not only in terms of our transit goals and, uh, and priorities, but also recognizing that starting in 2023, as we have in the past, there are transit obligations that will uh, continue to be uh, front and center as we move forward in 2023 and beyond, in particular, the Eglinton Crosstown and Finch West um, uh, transit programs. We continue to look at housing as a key priority in this community, and we, I don't need to explain to anyone sitting around this horseshoe why it is such an important piece. It is about a continuum of housing, uh, from those who require housing with specific supports, to those who require housing built that is simply affordable so they can choose to work and be in the community that they call home. We did address affordability in this, uh, in this budget, and again, that is about balancing uh, where we can see increases at an acceptable rate for the community and also uh, recognizing the particular pressures that all, all family members and all community members are facing at this particular moment. And then we also have legislative requirements that we can't avoid. One of those prime examples of that is in long-term care. As you know, the provincial government has set out specific targets for increasing the amount of direct care to residents in long-term care. Uh, those are obligations that we must meet. The good news is, is that Toronto, quite a number of years ago, dedicated itself to doing that under the CARE-TO program. Uh, but it does require investment so that we can be assured that we can uh, meet those legislative requirements. And as I'm going to touch on in the next few slides, we do, do need to continue to address COVID-19 impacts uh, in this budget. So those were some of the priority areas that we have been talking about for months and we have been using as a, as a guide and the reason that we had these priorities early on in our conversations, it was very clear heading into the 2023 budget that our process would not uh, allow us to explore and examine enhancements and new and enhanced programs across every area of our work, that we needed to be uh, strategic and prioritize where some of those specific enhancements would come from. And that's why these priorities were developed. So if we go to the next slide and look at some of those fiscal context pieces, now, this comes back to those unprecedented challenges that go into why this budget was so significantly challenging for us. We always have issues that we're dealing with as we build budgets, but typically that might be in an area of our work. That might be in a specific portion of the budget, the capital side versus an operating pressure. It might be the result of certain things that are going on. But as you look at the list that is on this slide, you can see that we are dealing with challenges that affect all areas of our work simultaneously. We continue to be uh, challenged by the uh, response to COVID-19. And I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail in a minute. The rising inflation adds cost escalations to the very work that we do on a day-by-day -day basis and the contracts and other things that we uh, are, are responsible to manage as we deliver that work. The interest rates has significantly impacted our capital plan. Our resources may be the same by volume, but our purchasing power has been limited because of those increasing rates. And so that has caused us to have to re-examine the 10-year capital plan with that in mind. Global supply chain disruptions, labor disruptions, and labor uh, shortages do impact our ability to deliver work, but more importantly, also impact our partners who we rely on each and every day to deliver some of the services and supports that are important here in Toronto. We do have, as I mentioned, some of those obligations around transit expansion, which start to materialize in 2023. There are growing demands for services. Some of those include services that um, really address issues that go beyond the borders of our city. Uh, some of that includes issues such as homelessness and our response to refugees, which has grown dramatically since the reopening of the borders uh, following some of the more crisis components of COVID-19. And then, of course, there were unexpected legislative changes just to make our life even more interesting. One of the more significant ones of those was Bill 23, which had an impact on our capital plan, as you know, and uh, you'll hear about how we have uh, incorporated uh, some of that thinking within our budget. Now, it's important to recognize that these are not unique challenges to Toronto. Other communities in Ontario and across the country are dealing with these as well. But it's important for us to place these as the context for the difficult conversations that we needed to have as we built this budget. And to remind you that these are also not specifically focused in one or two areas of our work, but stretch across all city divisions, our agencies, our boards, and our corporations. 
So if we move to the next slide, I, I want to just uh, spend a bit of time continuing to remind you that COVID-19 impacts uh, continue in this community and have an impact not only on our budget, but the way we deliver services and the response we have to the health and well-being of Torontonians. COVID-19 is a very real issue in our community on three fronts. It continues to be a health issue in Toronto. It continues to impact individuals and families in our community and will continue to do that for some time. That impacts some of our service delivery. Of course, it impacts our work in public health. Yes, their response is not as uh, large scale as it was at the height of the uh, pandemic and the crisis uh, portion of the pandemic, but they are still providing additional services and supports so that our community is provided with all of the opportunities that it needs to be uh, as protected as we can from COVID-19. But it extends to some of our other services. Think about long-term care and our shelters. The way we deliver services is fundamentally changed. And even though we have now better protective models in terms of our approach to infection prevention and control and the introduction of effective vaccine programs, we still have uh, changes to our service delivery in things like long-term care and shelters that impact the way we deliver our services. And then, of course, we have the financial impact, which is uh, registered for you on this slide. Since 2020, the city has experienced a, a tremendous impact on our budget of COVID-19. Those impacts are over $5 billion. The good news is, is that we have had a partnership approach with other orders of government to manage our way through this. And this has been a true partnership. This has not been about the City of Toronto simply asking for support and not doing its own part. As you see on this slide, $2.5 billion in city-led offsets and mitigation strategies throughout uh, the time from 2020 when this pandemic began. And we are appreciative and very thankful for the investments by other orders of government that have been received, which total, if we look at what we expect to receive through 2022 uh, and what we've previously received, some $3.5 billion. But COVID-19, from a service impact perspective, and particularly in the Toronto context, will not end in 2022. It will continue, at least in 2023, and our expectations are we will become more aware in 2023 of the long-term impacts of COVID-19 on our services moving forward. Toronto has some uniquenesses. One of those is in our transit system. We run the largest and most complex transit system in Canada. And as transit ridership has not returned to its pre-pandemic uh, levels, obviously, as you know, there has been a revenue shortfall in our transit system. But our transit system is the lifeline for how people move around this community and stay well, and also how the economy, not only of the City of Toronto, but of this region, continues to be successful. So it's one of those pieces where dramatic reductions in service is simply not an option. We need to work together with other orders of government to ensure that our transit system is there for those who need it. Likewise, in areas like our shelter system, which is the largest in this country, and is not just a product of 2.9 million people living in Toronto, and it's simply being exponentially bigger than other communities, it is by far larger than other communities' responses. And some of that has to do with other uniquenesses of our system. We today are sheltering about 2,500 refugees, doing our part to support those uh, who are fleeing their own country and coming to Canada. That places a burden on our shelter system. It also uh, produces a cost that is unique uh, to our community. So those two alone, transit and shelters, drive an incredible amount of our cost looking forward into 2023. The good news is some of the other areas are showing signs of improvement. Some of the other fees and the revenue that we saw such a dramatic reduction of in, COVID, uh, in the COVID-19 crisis years, as I call them, uh, are recovering. And so there are signs of good news. But when it comes to transit, when it comes to looking at the needs of those who are homeless, uh, it is our sense that definitely in 2023 there is a huge pressure, and it is a pressure that may continue beyond 2023. So this slide seeks to show you that while there has been some movement in the positive direction from 2021, which was the first full year of the COVID-19 impacts financially, uh, we still have a considerable gap that needs to be uh, dealt with in a partnership approach with other orders of government. 
We do need a whole of government approach, not only from a COVID-19 recovery perspective, but really as we look at how we invest and how we move forward with critical services in our community. And this is something that we have lots of precedent around and actually lots of success around. We have found ways to build housing together. We have found ways to support public health and the health needs of our community together. And we need to continue to do that across all of uh, the areas that are listed on this slide. Our recovery, not only from COVID-19, but our recovery economically and socially as we move forward will be tied to the success that we will have working uh, all three levels of government together to do what is right for Toronto. And so that is a theme that you'll hear throughout the presentation this morning. And again, that is not about looking to others to solve our issues. It is looking for a partnership model where Toronto will do its part as it has done for many, many years. We need that continued partnership in order to be successful. Because as we move to the next slide, it is critically important that our recovery in Toronto goes uh, well because it has such an impact on the rest of the province and the rest of the country. If you think about the nearly 50 billion in capital investments that are planned over the next uh, 10 years, any reduction in that uh, ability of ours to complete that plan will have an impact on the growth and economic recovery of this community, the province, and the country. And so it's critical that we uh, you know, look at initiatives and look at partnership models that will allow us to continue on this path, whether it is in transit services and transportation infrastructure, whether it's in housing, including supportive housing, which is an extension of our healthcare system, whether it is our work on climate action to create clean net zero uh, economies and communities, all of those require us to have um, profound investments by provincial and federal governments. And really, that partnership approach will be good for everyone. It will be good for those other orders of government, as well as it will be good for the City of Toronto. So in closing of my portion of the presentation this morning, uh, you sense a theme here. This is going to be about a partnership approach as we move forward. And yes, the largest of that partnership is with other orders of government, our federal and provincial partners. But it will be a whole of community, a whole of Toronto and other orders of government partnership that will allow us to continue to move forward. As we look at how we will respond to the issues that confront our community, to the opportunities that are before us, we will need to do this in, in a way that ensures that our financial viability is supported by other orders of government. There is simply no way that we can officiate to our way out of it. That's not a word. I've just made it up this morning. Uh, that, will go, uh, that, will, uh, that will no doubt go viral. I've done very well up until that point. But efficiencies will not get us there. There's the better quote, and that was the one that was in my brain. But uh, uh, there we go. There we go. There's no way for us to do that work and, and close that gap that you see on the screen of $1.56 billion. There isn't a way that we can turn to the property taxpayers of the City of Toronto, to the ratepayers, to the fees in this city, and find a way to close that gap entirely. There isn't a way that we can, in good conscience, look at service reductions that would close that gap in its entirety. We need to work in partnership. And in doing so, we will find ways that we will continue to support refugees to, in their worst moment, find a new home in Canada and find a new home in this community. We will find a way to ensure that affordability of housing and for those who need supports in housing is there, which will help us ease the strain on our health care systems and other systems in our community. And we will be the kind of healthy and well community that we all aspire to do. So now I'm going to turn things over to Heather, who will provide uh, some detail on the operating budget, and then to Stephen, who's going to uh, work through the capital budget, providing you some more key details and information about both sides of that budget. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Could you recognize me here? Thank you. Yes, I'm just wondering if, because they are two distinct parts, the city manager's given a big overview, and now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of dollars, is it possible, and we'll only have five minutes, is it not possible to ask some questions about the high-level is issues so before we I, move to that other part? I think, as you will see, most of it is high-level. Um, my suggestion is, is we I will we'll probably do a couple of rounds. It's been tradition where we'll, okay. we'll do a couple of rounds. You have the one, but again, recognizing we may have more questions if that works for you, Councillor. 
So we'll, we'll probably do a couple rounds. Yeah, it's just yeah. that they're little. They are kind of distinct. One's a yeah, yeah. No, I know. Directional, and the other is the issue, the actual. So okay, Thank but we'll, we'll we'll again we'll we'll try to accommodate everybody with the amount of questions they have. We have to do a couple, couple of rounds. So thank you, Paul. Um, Mr. Chair, if you would, I'd also like to express a thanks to staff. Um, this is one initiative that the city engages in that in actual fact incorporates staff from all levels of the organization um, and all programs and agencies. And to say thanks is, is very understated. Um, there is an enormous amount of work and effort that goes into this, and this is really a demonstration of teamwork and collaboration. So I would also like to extend my thanks to staff. Um, before we jump into the operating budget, uh, Paul did mention, but I need to highlight it again. This is the fourth year that we're feeling the financial impacts of COVID. As much as we all hope that COVID is in the rearview mirror, the impacts of COVID are still lingering. And so much of what you will hear today uh, incorporates COVID themes as well. So today, in, in any year after an election, we combine the tax and rate-supported operating budgets together. And so when we combine those two budgets from an operating perspective, the total budgets that we'll be reviewing today are just over $16 billion, so $16.16 billion. And as Paul mentioned, we're also going to be uh, speaking about the capital plan, but it too is a combined capital plan for our tax and rate-supported capital budgets, just shy of $50 billion. On the operating side, again, for tax and rate operating budgets, you'll see that 87% of the 16 billion is actually focused on the tax supported operating budget. What that means is the property tax, our user fees, and other revenues that we receive are specifically focused on programs that are on our operating budget. When we look at the rate supported operating budget, we have our Toronto Water, we have our Solid Waste Management Services, and we have the Toronto Parking Authority, which is just over $2 billion. So from an overview perspective, Paul has given uh, some of this, but I do want to share that um, it has been very clear that this is a challenging year. Uh, and it's challenging because of uh, the, the enormous uh, headwinds that we are facing um, that Paul mentioned, and I'm going to go into detail a little bit later. But given the size of our budget is larger than most provinces in Canada, uh, the amount of time and effort that goes into juggling, balancing, analyzing, and evaluating potential uh, investments is enormous. So today we are tabling a balanced budget. We're focused on maintaining core frontline services and managing affordability. The 2023 operating budget assumes a 5.5% residential property tax rate increase, which is lower than the Toronto rate of inflation. Our year-to-date rate of inflation is 6.6%. This increase helps us maintain our frontline services. So back in December, City Council approved an interim rate increase for water and wastewater consumption rates and solid waste rates and fees as a, from an interim perspective of 3%. Today, this budget confirms those rates. The budget also includes additional revenue tools including the municipal accommodation tax increase of 2%, effective May 1st, and in a few slides I will share more about the city's actions to get to a balanced budget. <clears throat> the budget also includes a 10 cent TTC fare increase approved yesterday by the TTC board, which will be effective April 1st. And this represents a 3.1% increase, which is under the rate of inflation. Additional revenue will go towards maintaining frontline services and needed investments in emergency services, public safety, transit and housing, and economic recovery. And since we are still experiencing the impacts of COVID, 
the city requires support for almost $1.1 billion from the provincial and federal governments, including our COVID impacts of $933 million, our refugee response from the federal government of $97 million, and supportive housing commitments that have been made by the province uh, in earlier years, 2021 and onwards, for $48 million. Every year when we start a budget process, we are looking at what are the growth and inflationary impacts to the existing services that the city offers. When we look at, and this slide just depicts what our opening pressures have been historically from a growth and inflationary perspective. And you can see for the last four years, as I mentioned, we are incurring and experiencing the impacts of COVID. The good thing from this slide is you'll see that those impacts from COVID are, sh are shrinking. We haven't seen inflation that we are currently experiencing since the 1980s. Inflation is impacting our operating budgets and our capital budgets. On top of that, we're seeing a growing demand of services from our growing population, which when you couple with inflationary impacts, the city is facing a $786 million base budget pressure. When you factor on top of that, the COVID pressures, the refugee response pressures, the support of housing needs, the continued, sorry, the total opening budget pressure for 2023 is 1.9 billion. So Paul talked a little bit about the economic impacts. What I wanna do is give you a couple of examples of where we are seeing this and why we are not immune from the cost that everyday citizens are experiencing even in their home lives. As I mentioned, today's inflation, year-to-date inflation for Toronto is 6.6%. The cost of fuel, given the size of our fleet, a one cent increase at the pump, in actual fact, translates to $900,000. When you think of the size of our fleet, that actually has an impact of $46 million on our budget. From a cost of food perspective, we've got long-term care, we've got our student nutrition program, we've got um, our shelter program. When you look at food costs, the increases that we've seen are around 31%, and it translates to about a $3 million impact on our budget. From an interest rate perspective, in 2021, at the height of the pandemic, we were seeing the lowest interest rates that the city has ever experienced at a quarter of a percent. And today, we're at the highest since the last recession of 2008 at 4.25%. When you look at the growing needs of our capital program and you factor in these increased interest rates, in actual fact, there's a $65 million impact on our operating budget. So the purpose of this slide is to carve out um, the impacts of COVID and the impacts of other government support that we have experienced in the past few years and we continue to expect. So from a COVID-19 perspective, our transit ridership is still lower than pre-COVID levels. We started off in 2022 at 32%. We ended the year just reaching 69%. That redu reduction in ridership has a direct impact on the revenues that we generate to support our transit system. And we are estimating those impacts to be about 366 million for 2023. On top of that, we in actual fact see continued pressures in our shelter system. We offer temporary shelter sites across the city to ensure that we're in compliance with the provincial legislation around social distancing, isolation, and recovery needs. The city continues to be instrumental in support of the province's health goals and the health system, having administered more than 7.8 million COVID vaccines since the start of, our, of the pandemic. 
at our mass immunization clinics. We are still experiencing impacts across other city divisions and our corporate revenues also. So such measures are required to protect vulnerable seniors in our long-term care homes. And we're still seeing reductions in our corporate revenues, such as our parking revenues. For context, 933 million, which is our COVID impacts, is equal to a 24% tax increase. And as Paul mentioned, the city can't do this alone. We cannot solve these pressures alone. And this is a constant message that we've been sharing with other orders of government since the onset of COVID. So just like we've approached in our last few budgets, the city expects that it will continue to be supported by the government of Canada to cover the costs of accommodation for the influx of refugee claimants and asylum seekers. In response to federal immigration policies, we have seen a notable increase in refugee claimants seeking temporary accommodations. I'm going to share some stats with you shortly. As a federal responsibility, the city requires financial support from the government of Canada to ensure incoming refugees are provided with temporary shelter. In 2023, we are anticipating 97 million in funding supports towards these costs. We also require committed funding supports of 48 million from the province of Ontario for the continuation of the supporting housing commitments they initiated in 2021. And again, the city can't address these alone. We would welcome the opportunity to participate in conversations about alternative means of financing for cities, which the pro province has suggested. So everyone has been asking and everybody has been wondering about how did we balance? What I'm gonna do is break it out into three buckets. Firstly, on the base budget pressure. The base budget pressure was 786 million. As we approach every budget year, one of our principles is to preserve frontline services for residents and businesses. We try to find as many offsets as we can to ensure that there are no impacts to Torontonians. Going into 2023, as I've mentioned, there are enormous challenges. In total, we have been able to identify 498 million in additional revenue for 2023. We explored how we could immediately generate more revenue from both our traditional and new tools for 2023. So this includes the property tax increase of 5.5% to the residential rates. It includes our assessment growth, which reflects any new property tax revenue arising from new developments or improvements. We're seeing a positive return to tourism in Toronto. So that coupled with an increase to the municipal accommodation tax will generate additional revenue. We are implementing user fee changes and seeing increased volumes in some areas as we emerge from the COVID pandemic. And this includes also a 10 cent fare increase for the TTC effective April 1st. Thankfully, we are seeing our corporate revenues recover which means a gradual increase in city dividends. And then also too, we have implemented the vacancy home tax in 2023. However, only a portion of that vacancy home tax is focused on the operating budget. The majority of it is for the capital plan. <clears throat> we then do an expenditure line by line review. We ana analyze the demands on city service we review the actual spending trends that we've experienced, and we, align, we have aligned our budgets with actual program experiences. The city continues its modernization efforts through Modern TO, which better utilizes city office spaces. And this year alone, we expect to incur more savings. We're experiencing substantial savings how we, on how we do our procurement. Our procurement strategies benefit not just the operating plan, but the capital plan and our rate plans. We do have savings. 
We have looked at savings where frontline services are not impacted. We have recommended impacts to non-frontline services, such as reducing holiday and weekend hours in city buildings, closure of info TO kiosks, decreasing the reliance on external vehicle rentals. And we are discontinuing the mechanical leaf service as this isn't a citywide service. And we were at the end of a very long-term contract. So I'm sure that people can appreciate that trying to balance a $16 billion budget does not happen overnight. It doesn't happen on the back of a napkin, but we are balanced. So now I'm going to go into the next bucket. The COVID-19 pressures. So as mentioned, we are relying on other orders of government to continue to support the city on the impacts to the transit system, on our shelter system, on our public health needs. This budget will assume that that continued support continues in 2023. If we don't have adequate so so funding support, we have made provisions with a one-time uh, set. Of, we have made one-time provisions, which is funds set aside specifically to support our COVID. Uh, pressures. However, I want to explain that these funds that we refer to as our backstop strategy are a one-time solution. In the event we had to leverage our backstop strategy, we would no longer have the ability to rely on other orders of government because we would be out of balance. It is because of that backstop strategy that we can say our COVID pressures are balanced. In the event that we were to exhaust that one time or backstop provision, we would be forced to reduce services, increase taxes and impact our capital plan. Similarly, the third bucket, supportive housing and refugee response, the city needs confirmation for the continued support of 145 million. The budget assumes full support towards the amounts that the federal and provincial government have supported in the past. If sufficient funding isn't received, our one-time emergency reserves will be depleted. And I just want to reiterate that using any emergency reserve funds or backstops to address these pressures would mean in 2024, there would be the requirement to increase tax or a combination of increased tax and a significant reduction in city services. So when we look at our operating budget, again, we are combining our tax and our uh, rate supported budgets together. Where does the 16.16 billion come from? So you can see that our property tax revenue combined with our federal and provincial revenues for cost shared programs and our COVID supports are just over 50, 56% of our total revenues. We are anticipating and we have included in here the continued support for transit. However, the transit fare revenue also reflects a 10 cent fare increase. Pre-pandemic, the fare box covered about two thirds of transit expenditures. For 2023, transit fares will only cover 39%. So you can see that it's not sufficient to cover the growing costs associated with operating the third largest public transit system in North America. Land transfer tax is being budgeted at 950 million of which 150 million is funding towards the capital plan, consistent with how we've treated it in the last couple of years. And this has proved a sustainable, predictive and effective strategy to transition a portion of the land transfer tax to directly fund the capital program. It's also allowed us to manage the effects of a real estate slowdown that we're experiencing in 2022. 
And finally, the remainder of our budget is funded by user fees, other sources such as dividend, interest income, and the vacancy home tax. On the right-hand side, you're going to see where the money's invested. Four and a half billion, or just 28 percent of our cost-shared programs with other orders of government include our Toronto Employment and Social Services, Children's Services, Shelter Support and Housing, Toronto Community Housing Corporation, Long-Term Care, Public Health, just to name some of them. Almost $2.4 billion is spent on transit operations, and I'm going to share a little bit more about the transit investments in a few minutes. Continuing down the chart, $2.2 billion is spent on emergency services, including fire, paramedics, and our police service. We have $1.2 billion in expenditures for financing, which reflects funding the costs of maintaining the city's infrastructure. And as you heard me say earlier, the capital financing costs have been challenged by the highest interest rates that we've experienced since 2008. More than a billion will be spent on other city operations such as city planning, court services, economic development and culture, municipal licensing and standards, and parks, forestry and recreation. Corporate accounts of one billion represent expenses incurred on behalf of the entire organization. For example, our insurance costs. Governance and corporate services of approximately 860 million includes ensuring a well-run city and enabling our frontline services, such as our 311 service, our corporate real estate management, environment and energy, our CISO, the Office of the Chief Information Security Officer, who oversees the city's cyber strategy to detect, prevent, respond, and recover from cyber threats. The city manager's office, our accountability officers, all of these investments in helping us modernize government, our resiliency programs, ultimately increasing our effectiveness of service delivery. And finally, the operational costs of our transportation services and agencies of, of $860 million combined. We also want to highlight there are several services in which we are in cost-shared programs, but in actual fact, our commitments to the cost-shared programs take us above and beyond what the other orders of government fund. So on the previous slide, I highlighted 28% of the city's budget goes towards cost-shared programs. In many instances, we are investing more to support a healthy, livable, and equitable city. This means we're investing in services that go far beyond what the cost-shared programs support. Approximately 22%, or 1.1 billion, of Torontonians' annual property taxes are directly invested in three key themes, which reduce the financial burden for other orders of government. We are directly investing $616 million in a range of housing services across the housing spectrum, including shelters, social housing, and affordable housing. We deliver key social services, including childcare, employment services, and youth development using $247 million in tax funding. And we're spending $256 million on health services, such as infectious disease control, long-term care homes, family health, all which contribute positively to the overall provincial health care system. So I want to share a little bit of um, data points surrounding our shelter system. The housing crisis that we are experiencing in Toronto is not unique to Toronto. It's actually being experienced across Canada. It's coupled with current mental health challenges, but because of the size of our city, that we are experiencing a disproportionate impact which is also being felt by other major cities across Canada. Pre-pandemic, the city provided 6,000 shelter beds, 
Last year, in 2022, we provided 8,500 shelter beds. In 2023, we are budgeting for 9,000 shelter beds. On the, the, just unfolding their shelter system a little bit more on supportive housing. Sorry, I'm on the wrong slide, sorry. So in our Toronto shelter system, there are beds that are allocated for, for specifically to refugees. In 2021, we had 500 beds that were focused on refugee claimants. In 2022, that number grew. But in 2023, you can see the enormous increase that we are budgeting for. We're anticipating that we will be housing tw over 2,500 refugees each night. This is why it's so important to emphasize on this slide that we are reliant on the federal government to support the $97 million that it's going to take for us to meet the needs of the refugee demands. The City of Toronto invests a significant amount of money into building and maintaining new affordable housing units. In 2023, the City will have 2,000 units available for use for supportive housing, 900 more than it had in 2022. Supportive housing is a key step toward ending chronic homelessness, which will, will reduce the cost of the healthcare system and other community services. In 2021, the province committed to support these initiatives by providing operating funding for the wraparound services required. The city requires confirmation from the province that they intend to continue to fulfill their original commitment. For 2023, the city needs 48 million to be able to provide the supports to properly address the needs of residents in supportive housing. And as we noted earlier, the Toronto Transit Commission operates the largest public transit system in Canada and the third largest system in North America. With that comes the challenges that COVID has presented, inflation is creating, and the new behaviors around ridership. However, the 2023 budget will ensure transit remains safe, accessible, connected and keeps people moving through a $53 million subsidy increase and a 10 cent fare increase. The 10 cent fare increase is under the rate of inflation of 3.1% and comes after two years of keeping fares frozen. The city's subsidy to the TTC has increased significantly from 547 million in 2014 to 959 million in 2023. That's a 75% increase when you are excluding the COVID impacts. The increased subsidy will be leveraged to support initiatives such as preparation for the Eglinton Crosstown Line 5 and Finch West Line 6, including operating training and mobilization activities for the start of service, which is anticipated to be in July. Expansion of the Fair Pass program, which is expected to increase the program's eligibility to include an additional 50,000 low-income residents. Enhanced, enhanced downtown station and streetcar route cleaning. Additional safety measures, including 50 additional hires comprised of both new and vacant positions. Managing the increased fuel cost to operate transit. As we noted earlier, increased fuel prices are having a significant impact on the TTC's budget. Prioritizing TTC routes in neighborhood improvement areas. And finally, the 2023 budget freezes TTC fares for seniors and all monthly passes. As Paul noted earlier at the beginning of the presentation, 
when we established our priorities last spring, emergency services and public safety were the two of the priorities that we were focused on. The 2023 budget includes enhanced investments in emergency services to improve 911 response times and public safety. The fire services budget includes 2.7 million to permanently invest in additional 52 firefighters. These new positions are year one of a three-year council approved plan to hire a total of 156 new permanent firefighters over a three-year period. The 50 new, 52 new positions will be included in 2023's hiring plan to fill up to 200 new and vacant positions in Toronto's fire services. The paramedic services budget includes 4.6 million for a permanent investment in 66 operational staff. These new positions reflect year four of a five-year council approved staffing and systems plan for paramedics. The 66 positions will be included in 2023's hiring plan to fill up to 250 new and vacant paramedic positions. The Toronto Police Services budget includes plans to hire 200 additional uniformed frontline positions, including new and vacant positions. This includes 25 special constables dedicated to enhancing public safety in the downtown core. And the budget also includes plans to hire 136 civilian officers, such as new 911 operators to improve response times. So the 2023 budget includes investments in a number of key priorities. The budget focuses on the delivery of core frontline services, such as, as I just mentioned, improving frontline emergency services and 911 response times, continuing our expanded sidewalk snow clearing, and ensuring park washrooms and water fountains are open in parks earlier in the spring and operate later into the fall. The, the budget promotes the supply and safety of housing. Last year, Council adopted the implementation of a new vacant homes tax to increase the supply of housing. This year will be the first year the city collects tax revenues from the program. The budget expands housing options, such as the recent legalization of multi-tenant homes, and enhances investments in the eviction prevention intervention in the community program or known as EPIC. The budget invests in economic recovery, including downtown recovery initiatives and maintaining the small property tax rate, small business property tax rate reduction of 15%, which has supported more than 29,000 small businesses. The budget invests in public safety, including enhancements to the Toronto Community Crisis Service, anti-violence programs and youth employment initiatives, and additional resources to promote community safety, as you just heard about. The budget also focuses on maintaining affordability with property tax rate increases below the rate of inflation, continued support for needs-based programs, and the investments in transit that you heard about, including the expansion of the Fair Pass program and freezing of the TTC fares for seniors. If we look to 2024, we do this every year, there is sufficient uncertainty surrounding the economic impacts that we were going to face in 2024 and the continued impacts of the COVID pandemic. The city currently anticipates an opening pressure of 1.5 to 1.7 billion in 2024. So if we continue to consider things in the three buckets, we will look at the COVID impacts. We will rely on other orders of government to help us address the 0.9 billion that we are predicting based on reduced ridership and the increased demands on shelter services, which is expected to continue for years to come. As the city recovers from the pandemic, we will analyze which impacts are expected to create continued baseline operating pressures. 
which will have a significant impact on our future financial outlook. The opening pressure of 2024 will also include estimates of 600 million in base pressures and separating out refugees and supportive housing. We know that continued funding support from the federal and provincial governments is critical. And as we've mentioned, we can't do this alone. So the property tax impacts. I'm just going to speak to you a little bit about what the increases mean for the average resident. So as I mentioned earlier, Toronto's average CPI, the rate of inflation for 2022 was 6.6%. The 2023 budget proposes tax rate increases below the rate of inflation. The residential property tax increase of 5.5% will translate to an additional $183 for the average home. A 2.75% increase for multi-residential properties, half the rate of the residential increase. A 5.5% increase for industrial properties. A 2.75% increase for commercial properties, again, half the rate of the residential increase as per legislation. The 2023 budget, as I've mentioned, also continues the small business property tax subclass, which was established last year in 2022 and currently provides more than 29,000 eligible small businesses with a 15% tax rate reduction, which is further matched by the province. As approved in 2019, there is an incremental increase in the city building levy of 1.5% this year, which will result in an annual increase of $50 for the average home. The city building fund levy is specifically dedicated to investing in transit and housing. You're going to hear more about the capital plan in a moment, but our capital plan continues to grow. The City Building Fund helps to address some of the growing needs in the areas of transit and housing. It provides dedicated funding of $6.1 billion in the current 10-year capital plan. The 2023 budget proposes extending the incremental increase of 1.5% to 2035. The extension allows us to address the increased costs of borrowing while making critical investments in transit and housing. As noted at the beginning of my presentation, the 2023 budget will consider both the tax-supported and rate-supported programs together. Back in December, City Council approved interim rate increases of 3% for both Toronto Water and Solid Waste Management Services, which includes water and wastewater consumption rates and solid waste rate and fees. The tabled budget before you today confirms those rates with no changes to the 3% interim rate. This will result in an average annual household increase of $29 based on 230 cubic meters of water consumed. And it will result in an average increase of $5 to $16 for a single family home depending on the size of their garbage bin. So taking a slightly different look, we're breaking down where an average tax bill gets spent. The current average assessed value of a home in Toronto is slightly more than 695,000. It's important to note that the current assessed values reflect a 2016 valuation date for the period of 2017 to 2020. Due to the pandemic, the province, who is responsible for the assessments, postpone the 2021 reassessment date indefinitely. As a result, 2023 property values are the same assessment values as in 2020. Unless properties have undergone significant changes, renovations or demolitions. This slide shows you where your property tax investments are going for the average home the property, average property tax bill will be $3,569. The 
The majority is dedicated to keeping Toronto safe and livable, with 28% invested in emergency services and 15% invested in transit. I'm now going to turn it over to Stephen Conforti, who's going to walk you through the 10-year capital budget. Thanks, Heather. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't also take the opportunity to thank all finance staff uh, across city programs and agencies, including our staff in financial planning, whose extraordinary efforts have enabled us to table this budget today. Um, so moving to capital, it's an honour to have the opportunity to present the 10-year capital budget and plan, um, which guides decisions on what investments will be made towards the acquisition, uh, development and repair or replacement of city infrastructure. So as Heather had mentioned, the 10-year capital plan totals $49.26 billion, uh, with $4.45 billion planned in 2023 alone. And nearly $50 billion over 10 years, this is the largest capital plan in the city's history. And the capital plan is balanced. We have maintained our debt service ratio under 15% for all years within our 10-year planning period. The budget continues to invest in key capital priorities of transit, housing, and advancing climate action goals. For transit, the budget includes nearly 14 billion, supporting investments like fleet procurement, including streetcars and zero emission buses, as well as investments in capacity enhancements for line one and line two, and steady state funding for state of good repair work to ensure safety and reliability of our transit system. For housing, the budget includes direct investments of 3.9 billion, coupled with a further $5.9 billion in additional city supports through foregone revenues and land incentives. This enables the city to deliver housing initiatives like Housing Now, uh, rental developments, and TCHC building repairs. The budget also includes an enhanced focus on how we leverage our capital investments to support our climate goals. In fact, the city's capital plan includes $17.6 billion in planned investments over the next 10 years that include project components dedicated to increasing climate resilience efforts and or reducing GHG emissions. All that said, this has been a unique, although not unique to Toronto, an extremely ca uh, challenging capital budget process. We're seeing significant cost escalation in capital projects, and this isn't specific to a few areas. It's being felt across all city divisions and agencies, with costs often doubling our pre-pandemic experience. High inflation, coupled with global supply chain disruption and shortages in specialized labor, are all contributing to this challenge. Just to give a few examples, we've seen three separate community, uh, community recreation center projects experience an average of over 70% in cost escalation in our capital plan. And in the case of renovations within police divisions, we've seen one case where cost escalation is experienced at 113%. Additionally, Heather had mentioned interest rates increasing from as low as 0.25% in 2021 to 4.25% today, which is the highest rate we've seen since 20, uh, 2008. This impacts the affordability of our capital plan, and we're paying much more now to service the principal, and more specifically, the interest payments associated with the debt funding used to deliver our capital projects. To address these challenges, the capital plan is supported by an extension to the 1.5% annual increase to the City Building Fund, providing additional funding dedicated towards critical investments in transit and housing. The capital plan also leverages the success experienced in issuing both social and green bonds to finance capital infrastructure. We have been a leader in this area and have now issued over $1.2 in green and social bonds since 2018. Green bonds have resulted in some of the lowest cost of borrowing the city has been able to achieve in decades by virtue of the environmental benefits inherent in our green projects, which helps to mitigate against the higher interest rates we're seeing on our conventional bonds. And lastly, the capital plan maximizes the use of development charge funding against eligible projects, with $6.2 billion planned over the next 10 years. This change is consistent with rates and eligible growth-related projects approved by Council when they considered the City's growth funding tools last summer. While the budget maximizes the use of development charges, it is expected that the impacts of Bill 23 will result in a loss of $2.3 billion in predominantly development charge funding for the City over the next 10 years. The capital plan, consistent with provincial assurances, expects the full reimbursement of Bill 23 impacts from the province, Without this, reimbursements, we, we know, uh, excuse me, without this reimbursement, we will need to cancel capital investments. 
I'll speak to that a bit further, but it's also important to note that this growth and success of our capital program not only supports our infrastructure needs, but it's important to the success of the city's, provinces, and country's economy. It was estimated a couple years ago that we create roughly nine jobs for every one million in capital spending. And again, we plan to spend 4.45 billion in 2023 alone. Uh, next slide, please. So the capital plan is nearly 50 billion and will guide decisions on what investments will be made to purchase, build, and repair city infrastructure. Uh, looking at key investments in this chart, you can see that over 15 billion or 28% of our capital plan is directed to water and wastewater infrastructure and stormwater investments, which is predominantly supported through the water rate revenue and planned 3% annual rate increases um, and has no reliance on tax-based funding sources. The city's highest investment of tax-based funding is in transit at 13.8 billion, which represents 25% of the total capital plan. This builds on the investments committed to in prior years, which through the city building fund uh, previously enabled us to double our historical investment in funding towards transit state of good repair. The city is also committed to spending 3.9 billion in housing, coupled with a further 5.9 billion investment through foregone revenue in the form of land value and financial incentives. This funding will be used to continue to support the development of 20,000 affordable homes and will move the city towards the goal of supporting 40,000 new affordable housing houses under the Housing TO Action Plan. To create the remaining 20,000 new affordable homes, we will require added investments from the federal and provincial government. We're also investing a further 5.5 billion in transportation and mobility through investments in road and bridge repair and in safety and cycling infrastructure. The city will also spend $4 billion in environment and recreational initiatives. This includes investments within parks, waterfront revitalization, environment and energy, as well as the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority. The left side of the chart speaks to how the capital plan is funded. Um, by far, our largest area of capital funding is from water rate revenue, totaling $14 billion which speaks to the success we have had in directing annual water rate increases to support investments in water infrastructure. Debt funding totals 6.2 billion, and while we're seeing increased debt servicing costs with higher interest rates, we do benefit from the use of green and social bonds while ensuring our debt service costs remain under 15% in each year of the capital plan. Development charge funding of 6.2 billion represents 13% of total capital funding dedicated to growth-related investments. A portion of this funding is now at risk given the impacts of Bill 23. As I had mentioned previously, the budget was built expecting the full reimbursement of Bill 23 impacts from the province, consistent with provincial assurances. City building fund totals 6.1 billion or 12% of total capital funding and is applied against transit and housing initiatives. Reserve funds, excluding draws from our water reserves, development charge and city building fund reserves, account for $3.8 in capital plan funding. This level of funding is consistent with commitments against city reserves where annual contributions are made, often through the operating budget to support planned capital investments. An example includes fleet, uh, fleet reserve contributions that support fleet procurement plans in our capital budget. Uh, there's a further $3.8 billion in capital from current funding. Uh, in 2023 alone, the operating budget will contribute nearly $344 million in CFC funding to capital, reflecting an increase above 2022 funding levels. And lastly, our capital plan continues to leverage funding partnerships with the Government of Canada and Province of Ontario, with total combined funding of $5 billion, reflecting 10% of our total capital funding. Next slide, please. As mentioned, we continue to grow our capital plan with significant funding directed towards our capital priorities of mobility and housing, as well as further investments in flood protection and recreation and parkland and other capital infrastructure. Within mobility, 1.2 billion in funding has been added with investments in our transit fleet program, including overhauls and acquisitions of 740 million, advancing work on capacity enhancement projects with nearly 170 million in line two alone. 75 million in added investments for stay good repair work on bridges and culverts, 35 million in added funding for the Broadview extension, and nearly 50 million towards the expansion of our bike share program. We're also investing an additional 900 million in housing projects. 
This includes 840 million added in Housing Now, Rental Development, and Emergency Housing Action. There's an additional 30 million directed to uh, TCHC development projects and additional funding for state good repair work within our long-term care facilities. This budget also includes an additional 700 million towards flood protection and parkland and recreational investments. The majority of this added funding is invested within our parks, forestry and recreation uh, capital plan for investments such as the Wabash Community Recreation Centre, new park developments and PFNR master plan projects. Also included is about 100 million in flood protection and mitigation projects for the Broadview, Eastern and Rockcliffe areas. Lastly, significant investments of 2.1 billion have also been made in other key areas including key side of 142 million that actually incorporates components of all three areas of mobility, housing and parkland. The budget also includes significant increases in investments in water and wastewater infrastructure, as well as nearly 140 million in our libraries and further investments in technology and modernization. While these investments have been a priority, the capital plan was developed with an overarching focus on all within all areas, ensuring we're leveraging our capital investments to support our climate goals. In fact, the added investments I just referenced help towards adding 2.1 billion in projects to the capital plan that include components that help us reduce GHG emissions and improve climate resilience. Next slide. Sorry. As mentioned, the capital plan was developed with a climate focus. In developing the capital plan, staff identified opportunities to leverage our nearly 50 billion in planned capital investments over the next 10 years to support our goals of reducing GHG emissions and improving climate resilience, ensuring consideration of infrastructure investments involve a climate focus as part of the decision-making process. Through these efforts, staff have identified planned investments in capital projects with components dedicated to these climate goals that add up to 17.6 billion over the 10 year planning period. This is evident in decisions that are being made in our investments in buildings, mobility and fleet, and water and waste, which reflect the main source of the city's corporate emissions. You may be familiar with our investments in zero emission buses, which is a great example of our climate focus, where we're able to leverage added capital funding to address a capital need while also advancing our climate goals and supporting our net zero strategy. This approach to capital bud budgeting is further expressed in our building investments. The net zero carbon plan was developed to provide a roadmap to achieving net zero emissions in our city owned buildings through a variety of investments, including energy ref retrofit projects, energy conservation and demand management, as well as building uh, automation systems. Our modern TO programs, as well as the construction of net zero facilities also advance these goals. In mobility and fleet, TTC is investing in zero emission vehicles, along with the expansion of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Further investments are also being made by the city towards our sustainable fleet plan. Investments are also supported by our rate programs, uh, including building wet weather resilience and reducing GHG emissions through investments in our wet weather flow projects and basement flooding protection, water efficiency and metering projects, investments in organics processing facilities, and landfill gas control and utilization projects aimed at reducing GHG emissions. More details on all of our climate related investments are provided in a climate investment briefing note that is available with today's budget materials. Next slide. The, capital, uh, the city's capital program has seen significant growth over the last 10 years. And this is also true in the level of investments we've made in state of good repair programs. As this slide indicates, the 10-year capital plan includes over 24 billion in investments in state of good repair. This reflects an increase in funding of 8.1 billion compared to the 2014 capital plan, representing 49% growth in planned SOGR investments. This increase in SOGR investments has been supported by the added capital funding through the city building fund, vacant home tax and annual water rate increases supporting capital investments. The focus has enabled us to nearly double our investment in base transit funding compared to about five years ago. Add 1.6 billion in funding towards TCHC building repair and then continue this commitment with additional funding continued to be added as we advance forward with additional years on our capital plan. 
Our plan includes added investments in fleet renewal, which consistent with our last slide, also contributes to our climate goals through our sustainable fleet plan. And lastly, Toronto Water Program that continues to place focus and emphasis on investments in core infrastructure. Investing in SOGR continues to be a capital priority and nearly 50% of the city's capital program is invested in capital repair. Additionally, other capital investments in health and safety, legislative requirements and even service improvements often advance state of good repair work. Despite this level of funding, it's anticipated that our state of good repair backlog will grow from 9.5 billion today to 18.8 billion by the end of our 10 year plan in 2032. This growth in SOGR is having the greatest impact on transit, transportation, recreation, and city building assets. Growth in our backlog has been a concern in the past, in large part because of the age of our infrastructure. However, we're seeing this challenged by further, uh, ha has been challenged further since the start of the pandemic, stemming from significant cost escalation driven by high inflation, global supply chain issues, and specialized labor shortages challenges to advance approved capital work because of those issues. Um, our SOGR backlog has also been impacted by the financial impacts of the pandemic on the city's operating budget, where capital projects and predominantly SOGR projects were paused both in 2020 and 2022 to ensure funds otherwise used for capital would be available to offset COVID support funding shortfalls in the operating budget. It's critical that steps be taken to curb the expected growth in our SOGR backlog. The extension of the city building fund will mitigate the SOGR, uh, the SOGR growth expected in TTC, as well as to a lesser extent housing. Continued development of our asset management plan with the next phase targeting non-core assets will help in prioritizing our SOGR investments. And lastly, the city will conduct a review of all remaining SOGR uh, challenges and provide strategies and opportunities to further increase SOGR investments with the aim to reduce the expected backlog for the 2024 budget process. Next slide. So um, I'd like to finish off with the impacts of Bill 23. Bill 23 was announced with the intention of increasing affordable housing. However, it has a direct negative impact on the city's ability to deliver the housing TO plan. It's estimated that Bill 23 will impact the city's capital funding by 2.3 billion over the next 10 years, predominantly impacting development charge revenues. In addition to the 2.3 billion, we expect ongoing, an ongoing deficit from Bill 23 far beyond the 10-year plan, as we expect continued growth and growth-related demands for capital infrastructure beyond the next 10 years. As mentioned earlier, the capital plan was developed with the assumption that the province will fully reimburse the city against Bill 23 impacts, consistent with assurances received from the province. Without this full reimbursement, we will need to cancel growth-related capital projects currently included in our capital plan. The impact would be greatest in planned investments in transit, housing, roads, water, and parks and recreation, which reflect 93% of the $1.9 billion in capital programs impacted by Bill 23. Of that $1.9 billion, $1.3 billion will directly reduce the city's investments in the housing TO plan delivering 40,000 housing units. In addition to lost capital investments, this could also result in the loss of 2,000 jobs to the greater economy. While projects will advance in 2023, without a firm commitment from the province, capital projects will be cancelled as early as the 2024 budget process. Uh, I'll now turn it back to Heather Taylor uh, to conclude the presentation. Thanks, Steve. So you've now heard from all three of us. We've emphasized the significant financial challenges. Um, I want to also reiterate something Steve mentioned, is that these challenges are not unique to Toronto. Uh, what is unique about 2023 is the fact that these challenges have come at us altogether. So if you think of inflation, you think of um, COVID and you think of the skilled and challenging labor markets we have, when you factor all of that in on top of interest rates, that is not unique to Toronto. What I do also want to emphasize is that the budget is balanced. And as I mentioned earlier, you can break that out into three buckets. Our base budget is balanced. We've balanced it using 
additional revenue tools, changing our revenue model, as well as looking at expenditure uh, savings. In addition to that, our COVID and our other orders of government buckets are balanced because we have a backup strategy. We have a one-time provision available. In addition to that, um, the, the budget does prioritize investments in emergency services, public safety, transit, housing. And the budget continues to enhance investments in climate action. Investments in sustainability outcomes are embedded throughout the capital plan. It also ensures we're fulfilling our legislative obligations, such as direct care we are required to provide in our long-term care homes. The budget promotes economic recovery with a focus on downtown recovery and a continuation of small business subclass rate supports. And again, we're pleased that the investments that we're making, we know that we can continue to face challenges, not just this year, but the uncertainties of what the economic environment will be in 2024. We know we can't, and we have never tried to, to think that we can accomplish everything on our own. We do require continued support and partnerships with other orders of government to ensure that Toronto remains the livable and prosperous city that drives the economic engine for Canada. And as I noted earlier, we would welcome the opportunity to participate in conversations about alternative means of financing for municipalities with other orders of government. So we're almost done. Hang in there. We only have a couple more slides. Just want to talk to you about the budget process um, and share some, I, I know the budget chair shared dates with you. Uh, so later this week, we will be having the detailed presentations for program areas and our agencies on January 12th and 13th, so Thursday and Friday of this week. Next week, on January 17th and 18th, as we've done in prior years, we are having public deputations in all four areas of the city. But this year, we get to actually do it in person for the first time since the pandemic, as well as adding the hybrid model of having virtual uh, participation. Um, in addition to um, these meetings, the Budget Committee will have one wrap-up meeting on January 24th. And from there, recommendations will be made to the mayor and he will propose his budget on February 1st as he's legislatively required to do. Two weeks later, there will be a special city council meeting to debate the budget. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Heather. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we will now get into questions of the presentation. Um, what we'll do is we'll begin with uh, outside councillors first as their tradition and then go inside to committee members. If we feel we need to do a second round, uh, I think that would be a, a probably a good thing to do. Outside councillors, uh, Councillor Perks. To start again, well, we'll do five minutes, typical five minutes, and then we'll move um, on. Thank you. Before you start my clock, I'm just curious, when will we actually get the analyst notes? Stephen. Um, yeah, so the analyst notes are with clerks right now, and uh, the will be up. I know that staff are putting them online. The expectation is that they would be up this afternoon um, after the links are up on the clerk's website. Wait, do, you, do you have an idea when, when they'll be posted? Uh, following, the following the meeting, uh, the goal is the as quickly as possible after the meeting, yeah. But again, I, that's usually as quick as possible after the meeting. Okay. Just it's, it's worth noting. Yes, it is. Yep. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for the presentation to all three of you. Um, there are a, a couple of questions that have occurred to me. This budget, the actual numbers in here, if I understand it correctly, assumes we're getting the money for Bill 23, but there's a backup strategy just in case. Am I correct in that? The numbers in here show us getting that provincial money. Uh, not quite. So we built the 10-year capital plan, assuming that we would continue to receive the level of development charge funding we were expecting. Yes. 
Um, if we are not reimbursed, we will need to revisit our capital, our growth-related capital projects and actually reduce or cancel projects. So the 10-year capital plan and the operating budget that are in front of us assume we continue to receive that same revenue or something to compensate for it? We assume that we will continue to receive the level of development charge funding we would have received. Or some equivalent. Okay. Similarly, uh, does this budget presented here today assume additional COVID supports for the city? Yes. Okay. And does the budget presented here assume that the federal government is going to help us with refugee housing and that the provincial government is going to help us with housing supports? That's correct. What is the total assumption for which we do not have uh, a written agreement with a dollar amount from the provincial and federal governments? How much in total from those four things and any others are we just assuming comes in in the numbers that are presented here today? We're doing the quick math for you. Okay. So 933 is the COVID, 48 million is the um, supportive housing, and 145 is the, um, is the, um, sorry, 48 is the supportive housing and 97 is the refugees. So that all yes. adds up to one. Sorry? Three. 2.3 billion is Are you session. including the, um, the bill sorry, Bill 23 as well? Yeah. Or, yes, 3.378 billion. So the, so the numbers we have in front of us assume 3.378 seven, seven, billions from other orders of government that we do not yet have in hand? Not quite. That's because of the development charges are slightly different. Well, I don't think we have that one in hand yet. But anyway, um, in uh, Appendix 1 on page 2, um, there is a very large amount uh, that I don't understand. I'm looking at the line, which is other corporate expenditures, and I see it's in, uh, intended to decrease against last year's other corporate expenditures by 112 million. What is that? Uh, through the chair, so I know we'll, we'll be coming back Friday and we can get into the details on the, on the non-program budget. There are provisions that have been included in other corporate expenditures, generally salary provisions for contractual agreements, um, for collective agreements, sorry. So what you're seeing in there is the reversal of some of that with the funds now being placed in the city divisions. But we can, we can come back with the... No, I, I understood. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, in your presentation... Sorry, I'm jumping around. I'm, this is just the order the notes occurred to me in. Um, on the 2023 state of, good back, state of Good Repair Backlog is a total percent of asset value. I, I, am, I am mystified that it describes the beginning balance of State of Good Repair Backlog at the Toronto Transit Commission as zero dollars. Help. Uh, through the chair, again, I think that, that's probably a detail we can get into with the TTC. Their general I, thought that, I thought that their current stated capital repair backlog was over $10 billion. So their stated capital repair backlog is expected to grow, and it's expected to grow based on the deterioration of existing assets, and it's also a large mm -hmm. component is their fleet replacement requirements. They maintain, and they've continued as long as I've dealt with the TTC, they maintain their backlog in a state for that year and ensure safety and reliability of their network. I'm sorry. I, I, I heard every word you said, Mr. Conforti, and, I, and I'm not helped yet. This suggests, this slide, which you gave us, slide 55, suggests that the current state of good repair backlog at the TTC as of today is 0%. So I do not believe that to be true or correct. Can you help me understand why we're assuming that there is no 
state of good repair backlog at all at the TTC as of today? It's your last question. Yeah, through the chair, I, th I think that's probably better answered by TTC staff and their, their asset management staff, and we'll be speaking with them uh, on Friday. It's in your presentation, please. Which is collected from information we pull from TTC. I'm going to need another round, Mr. Chair. Yeah, no, I, more than likely. Um, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, thank you. Just before you start my time, I just have to get this answered because on Friday, it's the annual general meeting of Toronto uh, Regional Conservation Authority, of which there's quite a number of councillors on that, and it's also the budget date. So I need to know which came first, what got set first, because we generally have a tradition that we don't put these types of meetings on the same. So either TRCA put their date on after we set the budget meeting, or the budget meeting was set on the TRCA date, and I'd like to have that cleared up today, if I could, please. Um, clerks will try to find the answer. They don't have the answer right now, Council. They will try to find the answer And for is you. that not the practice at the city, generally, that we don't piggyback? We stopped that a long time ago. Yeah, yeah that is our practice. Uh, just to let you know, Council, the TR, you saw in the the Thursday TRC, any questions on the TRCA will be coming up Thursday night. So, right? No, it's not about the question. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. It's not about whether we can be here. It's that the members are at an annual general meeting at the same time as it's the two days to be able to ask questions on the budget. So I'm quite concerned that that's happened, and I'm trying to understand how that happened because it's not our practice. So, Correct. It's not our practice, but I think clerks will have to, I don't think they can, speaking for them, I don't think they can answer at this point on that. I think, I think generally, given the... As clerks have just said, uh, in general, they try to avoid that. Uh, the challenges have been getting into an election year. There are different challenges coming out of an election year, trying to pull the budget together sounds as if, well, it doesn't sound, there is a conflict, unfortunately, but they do everything they can to ensure that that doesn't happen. So it sounds like it was the city that put the meeting on the 13th. And it could it be changed? And there's eight councillors that won't be here. Uh, again, I, I can't answer that at this point. My assumption is, is, is it'll be very challenging, difficult to change um, the budget committee meeting for next Friday. This Friday. Oh, sorry, this Friday, yeah. The 13th, I'll be yeah, 13th. Well. Yeah, it is Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you're noting my concern uh, about that. Um, I just, you mentioned there's a backstop. So we have the issue of the large amount, I've got the 900 million COVID, et cetera, et cetera. What is the backstop plan quickly? Getting money from the other levels of government or finding it in our capital reserves? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the backstop for COVID is the fact that we have put aside a provision. And in the event that we don't receive funding, we will have to dip into that provision. But once that provision is exhausted, we will no longer have a backstop. And the provision is capital? No, no, no. We have put money aside. We have put, over the course of COVID, we have been putting money into a reserve as a COVID backstop. I see. And where's that money come from for the COVID reserve? It's come from several sources over the last few years. Um, we have set aside money when MLTT outperformed our budget. We set aside money as a COVID backstop. And if you think about COVID, um, council policy is typically when we have surpluses, they get directed to the capital financing reserve. So that is why we say that these monies would have otherwise been invested in capital. We also received um, a one-time doubling of gas tax from, from um, the provincial government. And we set aside that, that one-time doubling uh, also in our COVID reserve. So there's been several sources, but those are two of the main ones. Thank you. And uh, just the, the gardeners mentioned in here, can you just quickly remind us of the actual cost for the hybrid and the cost for the actual takedown. There was a delta of, I think, about $488 million. But I'd just like to be clear on those numbers. 
Uh, Three, Mr. Chair, I think those are details that will be in the program reviews. We don't have that information with us. Well, perhaps somebody could get that while yes. I'm here, because I'll be at the TRCA. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure it's available. Um, the Broadview flood protection and the Broadview extension, uh, is the city paying for those? Why would the city be paying for those? Uh, through you, Mr. Oh Chair. So on Broadview Avenue extension, that we do have a component part to Councillor Fletcher and the other parts paid by Cadillac Fairview on the Broadview Eastern flood protection. It is uh, one third being covered by the city and the balance being covered between the development so and the, the property. Same as the waterfront, but the, the Broadview extension is entirely, it's one half and one half. Uh, Broad, Broadview Avenue extension, I'd have to get back to you with exactly the split. It's Do not- Do we generally pay for developers' roads? Generally, is that the city policy? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Again. Do we generally pay for developers' roads? Is that our city policy? No. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I think that's, we can get into more detail on the cost. There's difference between north of the berm and south of the berm, Councillor Fletcher, in how the costs are being allocated, and I don't have those numbers in front so of me we'll right now. We'll probably get those later. Could you elaborate on what the provincial alternative means of financing is, please? You've mentioned it a few times. Three, Mr. Chair, actually the province has, invite, has suggested that we come together and look at other ways of funding other than just direct grants or cost-shared programs. Um, so actually, don't know yet what that means because we actually haven't sat down at the table. So you say you're very happy about that. We welcome. But if that is that a P3, is that selling assets? Is that revenue tools? What must have some idea what it is. Currently, right now, when we receive funding from the federal government, it's typically around capital. Um, typically, when we receive funding from the province, uh, it is either a cost-shared program or it is a capital in nature. We are just looking at what other models may be available for municipality sustainability. And so it's not necessarily specific to Toronto, but it's municipalities looking for a different funding model with either the federal government or with the provincial government. Um, so we have some idea of what those are then. What are those in general? We actually don't have ideas of what those are right now. When it has generally, been, not their idea, but the general idea of all. An example would be that um, right now, transit systems do not receive operating funding. We receive capital funding and for capital projects, expansion projects, yes. as you well know, but we don't currently receive yes. Operating funding because when the Harris look, government took that away in 1995. When we look say. at other provinces and other financing models for transit systems, we are hoping that there will be an openness to look at other models. Um, I'm probably almost out of time, but I do have quite a few more questions, Mr. We can. Chair. We will be doing a second round. Pardon me. We will be doing a second I've got round. Time for what's our okay. obligation on Keyside? Um, which you've mentioned, and how much is it? Um, I can, yeah, sure, go ahead. Great, through you, Mr. Chavez, say, Steve, I think you mentioned the exact number. Yeah, I believe, uh, I think it was 140 million, uh, or 142 million or so, and that's investments that we're making both in transit infrastructure, investments that are being made in parklands, there's investments, a component of that, contributing to housing, uh, and it's part of the wholesale development. Has it been approved previously? I don't think so. Uh, through you, Ms. Mr. Chair, has the, the city contribution to Keyside? Right. We have come forward with reports in the past, Councillor Fletcher, that in respect to the, uh, the allocation. Yeah. Okay. And we will be reporting back out, I think, uh, in the next, by March, April. Okay. I'll wait for my next round, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any, uh, Councillor Myers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the Chair. On page 27, we say that there is a 5.5% rate of inflation uh, property tax increase, but when you add that up to the 1.5% building levy, um, that's 7%, and then we state that it's assumed at below inflation, but for the average property taxpayer, um, that actually is 0.4% above the rate of inflation. So do you not think that's slightly misleading when we use that type of language? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for the question, Councillor. Or inaccurate. In the past, we have always emphasized that the rate below inflation is specific to the property tax 
base. The city building levy is a, is a tax that is directed towards the capital program. So we have always kept them very distinct and we've always talked about them very, very separately. So when we talk about uh, under the rate of inflation, I don't think we're being misleading because that is the, you know, that is what we're tracking against for the purposes of our property tax operating budget. Uh, through the chair, right. But when you read the headlines, it's saying 5.5% property tax increase, but in actuality, people will be paying 7%. So I think that's why I think it's slightly misleading or inaccurate to say that. I understand what you're saying, um, but I think it's important just to be clear what people are actually paying. Um, secondly, I just was curious, um, what is the expected amount of revenue to be raised by the vacant home tax? So through you, Mr. Chair, do you want to talk to you? Vacant home tax is funding our capital plan. A portion of that, um, a very small portion of that will go into the operating plan. So uh, the hope is that um, the projection right now, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, we are basing our experience on what Vancouver's experience was, uh, the number of residences in Toronto and, and, and a rate um, similar to what their first year experience was. In the event that the vacant home tax does not generate the funding for our capital plan, then what we will do is we will slow down the investments that are directly linked to the vacant home tax. Oh, thank you. Through the chair, so what is the expected amount that we are expecting to receive for the vacant home tax for 2023? you, Mr. Chair. Councillor, we'll get that number for you. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Any other visiting councillors with questions? Councillor Sachs. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so uh, my question, I think, is for Ms. Taylor. Um, well, I, perhaps not. Perhaps for Mr. Conforti. So my first question is about slide 55, the state of good repair. Um, as uh, Councillor Perks has already asked, this slide shows the state of good repair of city assets deteriorating rapidly over the next 10 years to a much larger deficit, correct? Through the chair, yes, that's correct. Now, the, uh, how much would we be able to improve the state of good repair of our transit system if we diverted to transit the money allocated here for rebuilding the Gardner Expressway? Uh, I, we would need to go back and, and sit with our engineering and transportation divisions in terms of what would the net, you know, what would the net impact be after other obligations that we might have on the existing road network? Okay, I'd appreciate if we could get that information, please. The answer was he'd have to ask. No, the last part. You're using up my time. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Um, in terms of slide uh, 35, and I think this was a slide. Um, uh, about the investments in reducing emissions and so on. Uh, so again, Mr. Conforti, this is for you. Uh, the scientists of the world have shown that if we want to avoid sleepwalking to catastrophe, we need to be reducing our climate pollution about 7% a year. Is uh, this budget going to reduce Toronto's corporate emissions by 7% a year? Um, so I'll, I'll turn the question over to Josie Scioli. So, Councillor, uh, through the Chair, Councillor Sachs, we will come back to you on Thursday when we come and actually give you the information. Okay. Um, on slide 14, we have some information about the impact of fuel tax increase or fuel cost increases, and we know that dependence on fossil fuels is inherently inflationary, whereas dependence on renewable energy is inherently deflationary. Now, you've indicated here that the cost of fuel is going to cost an extra $46 million this year in terms of the city's fleet. But if the city's fleet no longer burned fossil fuels, what's the total amount of operating costs that we would save this year? Uh, 
Yeah, through the chair, I know we spend over 100 million and I'd, uh, we can get back and get the components that we see within both city divisions or agencies, but it's in excess of 100 million a year. Okay, thank you. And have, uh, has the city calculated the financial benefits of reducing traffic related air pollution and its impact on both the health of the city and the impact on infrastructure? Through you, Mr. Chair, I think as, as Deputy City Manager Josie Scholey just mentioned, when we actually get into the corporate services and the environmental division, those are questions for the details that that particular division head will likely be able to address. They may, but are you able to tell me, has there been a financial analysis of the financial b benefits of getting off fossil fuels? Has the city done that analysis? The ch uh, through the Chair, Councillor uh, Stacks, we have done some analysis and we will share that with you on Thursday. Thank you. Now, in terms of slide 24, um, I see there's a reference to enhancing the TCCS, uh, the crisis pilot, but there's no details. How much is being devoted to enhancing the TCCS, please? That's on slide 24. Through the, through the chair, it's just over a million. What it does is it keeps our pilot project whole. As we've begun the pilot initiatives, uh, the, uh, the requirement for 2023 was higher than we had projected. And so this ensures that those pilot initiatives can fully complete their work. So then we can do the analysis about uh, future expansion and also the performance of that program. So it's just over a million dollars. And um, again, and on Thursday, uh, Denise Campbell will be able to provide some further detail on that. All right, now the, the uh, attorney, uh, Auditor General of the city last summer made 25 recommendations for better value for money from the police services. Uh, nowhere did she recommend that we hire 200 more officers. She called for releasing um, frontline officers from wasteful activities such as attending a thousand times at the same fast food restaurant to deal with persons in crisis and she pointed out that it's much less expensive to have non-police responses to these predictable non-violent um, persons in crisis. Wouldn't the city both reduce suffering and save money if we expanded the TCCS much more quickly? So That's your last question. Chair, uh, we're actually uh, taking all of those uh, recommendations uh, from the AG and looking at those. There's a multidisciplinary team that's coming together to look at that. Uh, all parties agree, including the uh, police services board and the police, that uh, there are better ways of allocating resources to uh, allow parties to do what they do best. And so we'll continue to do that. The results of, of that work will be reported on. Um, and in 2023, you'll get the first stages of that. Uh, but absolutely, the work of this team, although it may not impact uh, directly into the early part of 2023, the goal is uh, to find a way that we can further invest in those programs. And to your comment about the expansion of the crisis uh, response teams, uh, absolutely, the goal at the end of the day would be to have that happen. We do need, though, to go through this pilot phase, understand the learnings from the initial parts of the programs and evaluate that before we start to expand. Our goal is that it is a high quality service that um, delivers what uh, we expect it to deliver first uh, before we look at other areas of the city. And I'm excited that midway through 2023, we're going to get the results of this first year of that pilot initiative. And um, as you've seen from uh, some of the initial reports, it's already trending in a very positive direction. Thank you very much. Uh, but I just want to remind councillors too, again, when you ask questions, it has to be specifically on the overall uh, presentation. We're getting into some questions, as, as you've heard from staff. We don't have the appropriate staff here to answer them. They will be answered on Thursday. So I just want to remind you that when you do answer the questions, attempt to, as much as everything in the budget is part of the presentation, try to distinguish what may end up being an item that has to be specifically answered on Thursday and Friday. Any outside, any other outside councillors? Okay, Councillor Marla, go ahead. Cheng. Oh, Cheng, I'm sorry about that. Apologize. She's beautiful. Hi. So are you, Lily. Uh, so, uh, a number, $3.378 billion was given to my colleague, Councillor Perks, that that's the total we're assuming from the government to make up for COVID shortfall. Does that include the 2022 484 million shortfall or is that excluded? 
Um, so that number, and just for clarity, when we gave the number on Bill 23, again, that, that reflects the full 10-year amount. If we were just to look at the expected impact in 2023 alone, that, that number's closer to $230 million or so. Um, now, in terms of the 2022 remaining shortfall, it does that number did not include that, and we're still having conversations with federal uh, government in terms of seeking further reimbursement against some of our existing 2022 impacts. So we have filled a gap in order to be alive today out of 2022, but we actually haven't gotten these funds committed to us, and now we're assuming going out on a limb that more money is going to come when even 2022 and the cost of that am i to understand that it was capital that was used to fill in some of that gap through you mr chair um councillor i just want us to take a step back um, with regards to funding, our prior experience over the course of the pandemic, given the fact that the federal and the provincial governments have a different year end than we do, uh, we have gone into every budget cycle with a gap from the prior year. And we tend to commit or get a commitment on funding that straddles our Q4, our remaining gap, as well as our Q1. And so, heading into this budget cycle is actually no different than the experience that we've had over the last few years. So that funding gap uncertainty with regards to 2022, we are optimistic that it will follow the same course of action. However, the 2022 gap, as well as the 2023, we do have a provision for. And that is exactly the approach that we've had and the experience that we've had success in over the last few years. So when we use capital to fill in the gap, the cost of that capital delay, for example, in maintain, maintaining infrastructure increases because now wear and tear is increasing, later delivery of construction costs increases. Is there a number amount that, you know, so we use 484 million to fill in the gap, but then the money that we've taken to fill in that gap in order to fix that hole is going to be more than 448. 84 million. Is that true? So through you, Mr. Chair, um, Councillor, as la I just want to reiterate what happened in 2022. We did not have sufficient backstop to fill the entire gap, so we actually had to look at our capital plan. If we weren't to have looked at our capital plan, it would have been a significant reduction. It would have been a $300 million reduction in our operating budget. Um, or equivalently just under a 10% tax increase. So when we looked at our options, the capital plan seemed to be the best of three bad options. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily address the question that you just asked in the sense of delaying state of good repair does make it more costly down the road. Yes, we agree. So do we have a price tag? Like how much did this $484 million cost us projected because if that's the price tag of the 484 million, is that the amount that we should be asking for instead of just meeting what's on paper? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councillor, what you see in the capital plan is contemplation of projects that were delayed and the more informed cost of those projects going forward. So if they have been quantified by staff, they are reflected in the capital plan. But I don't have a specific number to point to. I actually mean, so what is that? So if there is a running number, the more out, the, the time that we run further out from these delays, that, that caught the increase of cost that these, when we come back to it, yeah. There should be a clock on, and a calculator that's running a number for us to the point where then we get that money, then there's going to be a delta of what we're missing when the, when the provincial government actually fills in that gap. So where is that money going to come from? Or could we ask for that delta from the pro province? Through you, Mr. Chair, actually we haven't, we, we don't track the, the additional cost that that's going to uh, cost so there would be there wouldn't be an opportunity for us to go back against uh, and ask for more money from the other orders of government and given the fact that the 
just the amounts that we're experiencing, we're still trying to negotiate. I would say going after a delta would be more problematic. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cheng, by the way. Um, any other outside councillors who want to ask questions? We'll take it into committee then. Committee members, questions? Councillor Moyes, Councillor Thompson, and then Councillor Bravo. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, thank you to staff for this great presentation. Uh, thankfully, most of my questions have been answered by my colleagues, but uh, I think I do have a few left. Um, looking at page 27, I need to understand why under the residential properties portion that the residential is 5.5 on multi-residential is 2.75. I, I don't understand why they're not the same uh, levels of tax. I mean, there's a lot of money being left on the table here. For you, Mr. Chair, actually the the comparison of residential to the other classes that we have, we call them tax shifts. Those are legislatively prescribed. And so the way our tax, uh, the taxes for each of the classes are calculated is based on the residential rate. And so we have to achieve a certain tax shift ratio that's set out by legislation. Um, and the multi-res is allowing us to stay within the parameters that have been established. So what what qualifies as a multi-res? Is a condo a multi-res? It would be a, a building that has multiple units owned by mm -hmm. one owner versus condo units which are individually owned and taxed separately. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Um, one moment. So the shelter beds, um, you're saying that there's going to be 9,000 shelter beds by 2023, I believe. Uh, a significant increase, I think 28% increase. Are these beds 24 hour beds or are they nightly beds? And are they fully funded by the province and the feds? Or is the city um, pitching in semester funds for those? Through you, Mr. Chair, the shelter program is funded um, by the city and a portion of the shelter program is being labeled COVID. So there is a portion that we are, are uh, looking to other orders of government to continue to support, um, but the shelter program is funded by, by the city's tax base. Okay. And the full 9,000 are in our budget. Okay. I'll have to ask more questions about that on Thursday, but um, I also didn't see anything in here around uh, road maintenance and the gardener, but maybe I just missed it because that's a significant uh, capital investment in transportation, I believe. I'll, I'll look for that. and. Um, also, too, on page 30, I just think it's a little misleading that, just as an FYI, really, when under emergency services, it's $992 per household for emergency services when we know the police budget is significantly more than fire and, and paramedic. So that's just a comment I wanted to make. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thompson, questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I just have a few um, points that I'd like to have clarified. Um, when I look at slide number, I believe 27, 28, and 29, reflectively has uh, the varying percentage on slide 27. Particularly, I just want to focus on the residential piece. It's the 5.5 on slide. 28, it's the 1.5 for the city building fund, and then on 29, you've got 3% for water and then 3% for solid waste management. When I look at slide number 
48, and uh, it shows where the city is positioned in terms of its uh, taxes. Is that simply focusing on the property taxes, or does that actually include um, the, um, the other elements for other municipalities as well? Because you're comparing the, um, the city's number but does that also include in those other areas, do they actually have water include in that number? Do they have um, uh, the, um, the solid waste also included in that number? Or are we commingling them in a way that's different from others to reflect our position? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor. So yes, what we have tried to do, because each municipality is structured slightly differently, um, there is a footnote at the bottom that shows that we actually have included um, the, what we deem the average cost. So we've tried to normalize it for the basis of comparison. Okay, okay, so it's, okay. All right, then may I then ask a question on slide number 38. I think, Mr. Conforti, this was your presentation. Let me just flip over to that. And by the way, to staff, I realize that we're trying to save paper, but thank you for the paper because I'm really um, enjoying being able to flip through this as opposed to on my, uh, my iPad or computer. Uh, Mr. Conforti, through, staff, through the chair, through to you, you talk about the 10-year uh, capital plan and the assumption of reimbursement and so on, reflecting that the $2.3 billion that's expected to have an impact. And you break it down and you talk about the impact on, you know, recreation and other types of, and, uh, and parks and so on, which are hugely uh, beneficial to the city. I'm just wondering, first and for, foremost, how do you reconcile or what will be the sort of source of funds if we don't actually get from the provincial government the reimbursement piece that you are incorporating in terms of this particular budget. And then there's a second component part of that. There's discussions going on right now with significant sums of monies. In the case of Golden Mile, $100 million in terms of refund potentially to the landowners. Where is that reflected as part of your budget? Should we, should we be required to provide a rebate or a refund on the billions of dollars that have been expended for roads, transportation, and so on? Is this is all part of the capital. Uh, sure. So I'll start with the Bill 23 impacts, and, and I'll, I'll try on the second, and I may have to turn to our, our DCM of IDS sure. to support on that. Uh, in terms of Bill 23, so to your, to your question, yes, there's $2.3 billion in, in predominantly development charge revenues that we're expecting to now uh, lose as a result of Bill 23 impacts. Absent of that DC funding or reimbursement from the province, um, you know, likely we would need to look at the capital investments and the capital projects that we are planning to deliver over the next 10 years and scale back or defer that work. Um, there's, you know, to, to, to generate that level of funding uh, wouldn't be available. Yeah, there is, there is no backstop against that. But that also has, does that, and, and, and does that have the, it has an economic impact, jobs impact and so on. Is that reflected in terms of the projection that you made? So the budget itself is built on the assumption that we will be reimbursed from the province consistent okay. with commitments. If that commitment is not received, we would need to come back, scaling back our capital investments. Okay, and then on the 100 million piece? Sorry, on the 100 million, uh, I'm not as familiar with that development. I might, I might ask, well, it, <laughs> I may ask our, our DCM if she might have some insight on that. Uh, we, we may Adam, have to through back. you, Mr. Chair, through DCM, I'm just reflecting on the concern regarding the Golden Mile, that it has an impact on myself and uh, the Chair in our respective wards and the discussion that's taking place right now on rebates potentially to landowners. Uh, I've heard numbers like $100 million and more. I'm just wondering if that were to be the case, the expectation it would be within the context of being realized in 2023, I'm just wondering. Have we um, budgeted for that? Is there a pool of funds that will be able to respond to that request through the budgetary process? Because that has a huge impact. 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think any impact to the monies that are expected to fund our capital program in, to in total uh, will have a significant impact economically across the city. Specific to the Golden Mile, I mean, I'd have to defer to our... I can um, take it offline with you, but I yeah. just want to make sure that we factor that into our consideration and our discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bravo, next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, thank you to staff for this. Um, I think you, we can all agree that you've delivered us some pretty grim news um, in, a very, in a very fine That's way. That's normal, though. Um, so I just wanted to start uh, with the question um, about the vacant homes tax. Um, we are uh, inspired by Vancouver, um, and I'm wondering, given the, the state of um, our capital situation, um, would you consider, given the pressures that the city is experiencing, extending, recommending to extend the 1% to 3% uh, for the vacant homes tax as soon as possible? Through you, Mr. Chair. Councillor, that would be a council policy decision to be made. Um, right now, the staff are tracking you know, the registrations that we've received. And again, because it's this our first year of implementation, we actually are not, we don't have certainty around how much revenue it's going to generate, but as far as the rate itself, I think that's a council conversation. In any case, uh, what the projections would be three times as much revenue, so that's good. Um, that's good for us to take to council. Um, the next, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at page 55 and I, or slide 55, and I find it remarkable to pick up on what um, Councillor Fletcher was asking to compare. Um, the green arrow that go, is along with the Gardner Expressway and the, um, and the red, uh, little red symbol next to the Toronto Transit Commission um, in, t in terms of backlog of state of good repair. Um, can you explain this considering how few people in Toronto are served by the Gardner Expressway compared to something like the TTC, which is so essential? Uh, so through you, Madam, Madam uh, Mr. Chair, sorry, uh, the, the, the dollars, oh, it's one of those, the dollars representative of the gardener is not just for the elevated structure, but it is for state of good repair for the entire length of the X number of kilometers, um, and our engineer will be here on Thursday and can certainly help you and give you a sense of what the, uh, the impact of not maintaining the gardener could be from a public safety perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, we know that there are some options uh, there that haven't been explored. So we'll look forward to answering, uh, asking those questions on Thursday. Um, my next question is, I've got a lot of questions here, so I, I've numbered them in my little notes here. My next question is around, um, around the, the police budget, picking up on um, what Councillor Sachs asked. Um, Clearly, uh, we don't see any evidence that has come forward with the mayor's announcement for how increases in police budget are going to make people safer. Um, and, but at the same time, we know the um, AG report recommended 40% of uh, uh, emergency calls could be directed to non-policing responses. Um, you know, the question I had uh, was first of all around uh, the ways in which uh, the investments are largely going to be around policing poverty and homelessness in the city of Toronto right now. Um, why is there not um, a, a more significant increase in emergency uh, responses to the homelessness crisis here? I don't see a proposal to bring in a 24-7 drop-in shelter, for example. Um, we all know in our wards and in the city, people are turning to uh, public transit, libraries, 24-hour uh, uh, restaurants, as someone already mentioned, to find shelter, especially at night. And I'm just, I, I'm just uh, not sure where, why 9,000 when we know that the need is so much greater. So through the chair, I, I think Thursday is a better chance to dive into that as uh, SSHA will bring forward their, their components as part of um, <coughs> FDCM Raftus's presentation. So we'll get into that. There are significant investments in, in, in terms of the shelter response, and as you can see, that's a growing investment. But I think those questions about how we're balancing that plan out uh, are best addressed on Thursday. 
I beg to disagree, and I, but I won't push too hard. I think this is a vision document, and the vision here is that we're investing a lot more in enforcement, surveillance, uh, thing, uh, you know, things that end up in the criminal justice system and end up costing a lot more. We know that um, policing homelessness costs about $100 million a year, so I just, I'm going to say that I think that at this level we need to get the balance right um, based on evidence. Um, and so the next question was around the Toronto Community uh, Crisis um, Unit. It's uh, Councillor Saxel also asked about that. Um, I think you mentioned that the um, increase or what is what's recommended here is to keep the pilot whole. Um, we understand that 60% of wards are covered by this pilot. In my ward, it's just a sliver of the ward, so that if the ward gets counted, that the number would be reduced. Um, but we, as you said, we are hearing a, a tremendous amount of success from that unit with about 2% paramedics having to be involved um, after calls are directed to the unit, only 3% uh, redirected to police. If, if an in interim report were to come, um, come in time for us to consider an expansion of this unit, an in investment and expansion of this unit given the preliminary successes of the pilot, is that something that uh, at a staff level could be supported? Councillor, can I just interject here? I appreciate the question. It is a good question, but again, what we're doing is getting into the weeds of a conversation that will be happening Thursday. As much as this is a vision document, it's overall. And, and I think staff have repeated a few times the appropriate staff who could really answer the question, as much as I think the, the city manager and the CFO have a good knowledge, it's really the basis of information. Thank you, Thursday. Chair. So if we could oh, just a last question quickly. Is it? That, that was your last okay. question, actually. Thank you. Councillor Nanziata. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. There's been a number of questions asked as far as the vacant home tax. So it, we just started the program this year, correct? And so I don't anticipate a large revenue coming from that because uh, we just started it. And it was my understanding that when we approved the vacant home tax that that revenue was to go to housing. Am I not correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. So, Councillor, you are completely correct. It's going to housing primarily in the capital plan. There is a small amount that is being directed towards a housing program on the operating base, but the majority of it is in the capital. Right. But this year, I, I don't anticipate a large uh, number of revenue because we're just starting the program. And it's probably not going to be impacted to the middle of 2023. Am I correct? So, to include that in the budget, it's through you, Mr. Chair, actually, Councillor, um, based again on a set of assumptions that mirrors the experience in Vancouver, um, the amount is substantial that is being built into the capital plan. So th the the net amount is 41 million. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is as far as Bill 23, the impact in revenue. Um, so can you tell me what the status of that is now with the province and where we were at as far as discussions? Uh, so through the chair, uh, they're still unfolding. What we did receive was correspondence that um, suggested there's going to be an audit of municipal reserves and that piece has not started, so we don't have the terms nor the work beginning there. And as been referenced uh, a number of times here, that's where the assurance was also made that we would be, in their language, kept whole. So that's why our assumptions are not based on, on um, hopes, they're based on actual correspondence that's been received. So it's in its early stages is a short answer, and I think the first piece of work that uh, we would see unfold is this uh, audit of, uh, of reserves, and then okay. that will uh, probably force this, get us into the basics of the conversation of what happens next. But we don't know when that, uh, they haven't given us a date on when that audit would be done, uh, We don't have that information no, yet. No, no. Um, <coughs> forget what page mm -hmm. it's on, um, but the, no, not the big can home. Um, the one for flooding for the rock cliff, um, <coughs> the amount that you indicated, does that include, um, or I don't believe it includes uh, 
the additional funding we're getting from the federal government, and we also requested the province as well to give us some funding for that project. Do you know? Um, I think when we come back on Thursday and Friday, we'll have the specific Oh, okay, details. sorry. So that would be Thursday. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Crisanti is next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of uh, questions, uh, if I could. Uh, starting on page 20 with the uh, um, uh, question around the um, 2,550 beds per night for refugee claimants. So you indicate here that <clears throat> the city needs timely funding of uh, $97 million from the federal government. Can you give me a sense of, of this doesn't give me a lot of uh, much comfort in knowing, do, do we have that money? Are we getting that, uh, that support financially? Uh, is it pending? So what's the status of that? So through the chair, uh, the good news is, is that typically we have received funding. Uh, it's generally very delayed. So what we don't have is a yearly um, commitment to it. So it's, it's in arrears, essentially. So there has been funding that's been received by the City of Toronto over the last number of years. That number has been lower than what we're projecting here because the volume has increased beyond even pre-pandemic uh, ways. So what typically happens is we enter into those conversations and negotiations, but it's on a yearly basis. Uh, to date, they have come through with funding. But two things. One is the volume is more, and so the request is more, and we have no guarantee that that money is uh, going to be received. And uh, while we're waiting for this funding, then we continue to fund it through our own other means. And where does the money come from? And what budget do we tap into? Through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, yes. Um, we continue to pay for it. And as I mentioned, we do have emergency reserves that if we don't receive the funding, we draw from. Okay, thank you. On page, page 22. One quick Sorry. question, last no, question. No, actually, um, oh, when I, I spoke, I spoke, no, hold on. When I spoke, <laughs> I spoke for three minutes and you didn't reset the timer. Oh, okay, that's the, okay, so you still have three yeah, minutes. I figured I had time. a couple okay. of minutes. I'm yeah, paying no, attention. You've been watching. Thank you. I'm, I'm out of practice here. Thank so. you, Speaker. Okay, so uh, page 22, quickly, transit services. Uh, enhanced downtown station and streetcar route cleaning. I mean, this is a, a, clearly an ongoing issue in, uh, throughout the whole city. Um, uh, so when we're saying enhanced, we're already cleaning our subways. We already should be cleaning our stations and, and, uh, and streetcar routes. Uh, w what does enhanced mean? Are we doing things that we've never done before? And, and uh, we, uh, are we not on top of the cleaning issue? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, the experience through COVID, there was enhanced cleaning because of COVID um, experiences. You mean sanitizing and that stuff? Yes. Okay. And some of that, that cleaning has become part of the, the base scenario. So we're putting more money towards... The uh, resources. To the resources. And so, all right. And then the additional 50 hires, uh, can you uh, please speak to that for a moment? Uh, 50 special constables? Is that what that is? For, for yeah through the chair and, and again the TTC can get into this in greater details but there will be 50 hires of special constables of which 25 will be net new special constables within the the TTC's approved complement oh that was going to be my next question so the net uh, 25 is the net new all right and uh, back and down to page 23 of uh, the uh, fire services 52 new permanent firefighters is this also net new firefighters through you, Mr. Chair, the net new is 52, but because of um, a COVID delay in hiring, there is a catch up. So it's the combination, the 200 that's, that's referenced is a combination of the, the 52 additional and the catch up that the fire services is engaged in. All right. And same question for the paramedics. That's the same issue there. Same answer. <laughs> same answer. Thank you. And. Uh, one quick thing on the vacant home tax that uh, Councillor Nunziata brought up uh, earlier, and, and since it's the first year, do we have any uh, prediction as to what that looks like, that number could look like for this year? Through you, Mr. Chair, we are, are watching and monitoring the registrations that come in on a daily basis. Okay. Um, I'm happy to get you those stats if you're interested in them. Sure, I, and I would be. Thank you. And that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm assuming it's the will of the committee to do a second round. Um, so why don't we start? Councillor Perks will be starting this the second round. Thank you. Um, the, this shows a 1.5% increase in the city building fund. So what's the total percentage now? What does it get to? Is it like, does that bring it to four or something? Um, I'll have to do the math, but it started in 2017 yeah. at 0 0.5. Yeah. Uh, it was 0 0.5 in 18, 0 0.5 in 19, then it's been one and a half since 2020. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We're 0.5, 5.5. .5. Um, so it. three, six, nine, 10.5 is where we are today. 10.5, okay, thank you. Um, the state of good repair backlog shown on slide 55. I asked you about the TTC last time. This time I'll do transportation. So does that number uh, include the gardener? Uh, through the chair, and sorry, just one correction. When I said 10.5, I accidentally added the 2024 and 2025 amount. So it would be 9% on the city building levy for today. Nine, okay. Because of this year. Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, on the transportation number, I believe if you're referencing slide 55, and I'll, I'll, I believe what we've done is we've backed out the Gardner component of the transportation number. So what you see is the transportation backlog growing, absent the Gardner investment. Exclusive investments. of the Gardner. And then underneath is where we're showing the Gardner on its own. Okay, I just wanted to be, to be clear about that. All right. Um, I'm looking at the, the child care capital plan and I'm not seeing a significant increase. How are we, like, have we budgeted to accommodate the everybody getting $10 a day child care and having enough spots for that? My memory is last year we were concerned we didn't have enough spots. Or we're just assuming someone else pays for it or... Council, again, I'm thinking that probably is a Thursday. I'm, I'm referring to a number in the presentation okay. in front okay. of us. I need to know what it does. Major policy error. So this the, is the through, through the chair. Uh, there still are conversations in terms of how the capital program under the uh, Canada-wide early learning and child care program will roll out. Those are discussions that continue. So there would be continued minor investment in capital. That could expand greatly once we understand more fully uh, what the federal and provincial uh, guidelines will be on that. And uh, we'll make sure that Shanley is uh, able to provide okay. a few more details on that on Thursday. Excluding uh, transit fares, what is the percentage increase generally assumed here for user fees? Usually there's a percentage that we assign. Yeah, so it's, it's um, I'll have to go back and average it out. Essentially what it is is it's basket of goods for yeah. each service. So every every program is looking at their different costs associated with, with those fees. So in some cases, I think you'll see about a 4.5%. That seems to be a about common, four and a half common number, but I'd have to go back and double check because they, they range quite quite. Yeah, quite well, I'll get there will be some outliers. Um, how many positions are gapped corporate-wide here? So through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councillor, what we've done is we've adjusted the salary and wage number um, from an expense perspective to an existing um, allocation. We then, we're not looking at full complement, to be very honest with no, you. No, I know. I just want to know, given that we're not looking so at I full complement, how many positions are gapped? Officer, if she has a vacancy rate, but it's not gapping from the perspective. I just want to clarify. I know we've changed the language. I'm trying to figure out how many positions that we have in our corporate plan to deliver the services that we depend on are not funded here. Uh, through the chair, um, our vacancy rate um, is gone from 12% down to 10% and we filled about 9,500 jobs last year. Our, currently we have about 4,000 jobs that we are trying to fill. And the budget assumption here is that all 4,000 of those are like, how is it shown in the budget that they get filled, they don't get filled, they're filled for half a year? Three, Mr. Chair, actually not all positions are budgeted to be filled. So we've looked at it from two different perspectives. We've looked at it from what is the resources needed to deliver on the services 
And the second piece is, is that we expect a specific churn to reoccur throughout the year and all vacancies will not be hired at the same time. So there's a few different elements that are influencing the salary and wage dollars. Okay. We're going to have to pursue that a little further another time. Um, so be a last question quickly. Okay. Uh, I've heard two, I've read something different from what I heard in terms of community crisis response. Uh, in July, Council directed social development staff to do a request for expression of interest for additional uh, parts of the city to receive community crisis. And we were told that that, that would go out in calendar 22, that that would go out. Does this program, does this budget show additional areas in the city receiving community crisis response or is the increase just annualizing out some of the costs for the four pilots through the chair it's the latter uh, the expression of interest was to prepare ourselves so that uh, we again do not delay once the results of those pilot pieces are are, are there so um, so this shows no new areas of the city receiving the increases uh, based on the uh, the pilot areas that are, are currently in operation. Okay. Well, Thank I you. wish I had time for a third round, but I, I know you're all getting hungry. <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, visiting councillors? Okay, we'll start with Councillor Sachs and then Councillor Fletcher. It is, uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, following up on, on Councillor Perk's question, uh, many parks and recreations programs were cancelled this year because there weren't staff available to run them. Um, one of the uh, rumors, at least, about this is the city can't hire staff to, for these programs because they don't pay enough. Um, do we need to increase salaries in order to be able to properly staff the parks and recreation programs? And if so, is that provided for in this budget? Uh, so through the chair, um, we have been undertaking a review of uh, compensation uh, across the board and where we've identified areas, and uh, you'll have seen reports in certain areas where we've identified areas of, of um, deep concern, we've addressed that. I do know that in 2022, uh, recreation did make some minor adjustments so that they, they were more competitive in some of the hiring that needed to take place. It has allowed us to get back up to more of the level of service that was required. Part of the issue goes beyond salary. Part of it is also the training and all the things that stopped because there weren't the jobs because we weren't providing the program. So as we continue to work through it, um, anything that we have done or needed to do is built into the budget. We will continue to monitor how uh, compensation uh, looks uh, and if we do need to make those further adjustments, so we'd make them. Mary, do you have anything else to add to, to that? Same thing. Um, do we expect, therefore, that the Parks and Recreations programs will be able to operate their normal full complement this year based on this budget? Uh, so through the chair, uh, certainly on, on Thursday, you can dive into some more detail. I would say across our services, the goal is to get back to um, full level of service. I will tell you that the hiring challenges remain regardless of whether we're talking about compensation or not the volume of people is also um, a challenge for us uh, so there are still challenges in terms of our hiring plan but uh, the goal of recreation uh, as the goal of all our services is, is to uh, provide the level of service that people would expect and uh, we're working hard to get back to those levels um. Yes, uh, so Mr. Chair, uh, one other question about the state of good repair. Uh, we've seen the numbers in the capital plan about the rapid increase in the backlog and state of good repair for the TTC. Uh, doesn't that mean that the TTC vehicles will be less reliable, that service will be less reliable because the vehicles will be more prone to breakdown? Yeah, Councillor, again, I'm not sure if, if our st that's a TTC question that really needs to be answered by TTC. Uh, you know, so again, I, I think our, our staff, I know Steve's been over in the TTC, but that specifically is a question really for TTC staff. Well, is that's it, all. I'm just. Is it something that was taken into account in preparing this budget? So if, if, uh, with the backlog that we see for the TTC, a large component, actually I believe it's the majority, reflects their fleet replacement requirements. 
and that's what's reflected in the, t in the backlog numbers that we see in this presentation. So in other words, what this budget reflects is continuing to operate old polluting vehicles rather than replacing them with newer, less polluting vehicles. Is that right? Uh, I'd say actually, if you look at the capital investments that we make, I believe the number is about 700 million that we've added specific to TTC fleet. And I know that there's ongoing discussions with the federal and provincial government to seek what we've traditionally received, which is a third share from each order of government uh, towards fleet replacement. Well, thank you for mentioning that, because I, I also understand for, that for us to get money from the federal and provincial governments, usually the city has to put money on the table. Does this budget include enough money to put on the table that we can attract matching funds from the federal and provincial government? Uh, yeah, so again, this, the city has added and, and added investments in the TTC's capital program this year, specific to their fleet. Uh, TTC can probably speak to it in greater detail than I, but there's significant additions in our fleet uh, funding for the TTC capital program included in this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fletcher next. Uh, although some of the questions might be for the other days, it's going to be very helpful for everyone to know what they need to brush up on before we get you, there. You can put them on the table for Thursday. How's that? I uh, just have a couple of questions. Um, page, and I don't know if it's possible to do that, but on page 23, and you've mentioned climate a number of times, uh, since it's such an integral piece, I'm just finding it a bit off that it isn't somehow, not page 23, but the, um, page 33, the list, uh, 35. particularly 33, 35. 35, but in the, how the money's invested, just to be able to pull out the climate pieces on their own, since it's such a big thing, is that something that's possible at this level? Uh, through the chair, so there's actually a briefing note that um, that staff have worked on, uh, and it, it I believe it will be public today with all of our budget okay. launch materials that will provide you. further. I just what I'm trying to say is in water, in transit, in housing, in transportation, for each of these pieces, what are the climate investments? And I don't mean a briefing note; I just mean very public here. Is, is that possible? So uh, through the chair, we've identified a couple of the investments here in this slide. Beyond that, I know that the briefing note provides uh, thorough I, details in terms yes, of but this is the a chair public council document. So I think that's what I'm asking for, Mr. Okay. Chair, that we're clear on that question. The shelter beds, 9,000, does that include the 788 refugee beds, yes or no? Through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, it includes all shelter beds. So all shelter beds, so that's fine. Um, and then there was we have a we have a agency or a board of the city that actually invests a large, large amount of money. What's the annual yield on that? Do you happen to know? It doesn't show as a revenue source. Are you talking about city investments? Yes, our investment board. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, actually the investment board um, has diversified its investments, and over the past year. We, in actual fact, moved from fixed income, which is interest earning investments, Correct. into capital. Yes. Uh, into equity type investments. Right. And the yield? Um, the interest investments did sub substantially better than we had originally anticipated. And unfortunately, the capital markets, uh, because of the economic conditions, the markets didn't do as well. I'll get you the exact rates. Thank you. Um, but we are monitoring that. Thank you. Um, this is just on the fuel because you flagged that one cent increase is nine hundred thousand dollars, almost uh, almost a billion dollars. I'm just going to be asking, Anna, uh, what is the amount lost in idling in to the city? Do we know? Yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor. Thanks for sharing that. I have no idea, but I'm sure that uh, Through the chair, we fleet. will bring that back to you on Thursday, Councillor Fletcher, as best as we have the information. Do we do, do we measure that, uh, DCM? There, there's, I, I believe there's some of that has been done, but I, I don't know through all the uh, vehicle areas, right? So we'd have to ask the question. We'll do that. So for the fleets, for everybody, uh, would we be able to, once you look at that, determine the savings if the idling was cut by certain amounts for all fleets. The city has the biggest fleet. We will do our all. best. 
we, we will speak to the appropriate groups and come back as to what we can do on that piece that you're asking. Okay, thank you very much. And then just of interest is the change order that you mentioned earlier where a uh, police station went up to 113% increase. Uh, that would be a big change order. Um, where was that and how much was the original? And who managed, who managed it? Yeah, and I'm not sure if it was a, a change order. It might have been what the, the pre-tender cost estimates and some of the, the experience that we would have had prior to the pandemic compared to what was being experienced uh, current day. And it was a renovation at a, at a station. I'll have to determine exactly which station it was. I think the original budget was 12 million and there was an additional 13 million pressure associated. And is that managed directly by the city or by TPS? It's a, uh, through the chair, Councillor Fletcher, I'm going to validate this one, but it's a combination between T uh, through both organizations, CREM and them. So I'll, uh, I'll actually find that out for you. And just for fire, uh, 200 new, there's 52 net, and then there's a number of retirements, but there were 200 new firefighters in 2022. Is that the same number you're talking about here, or are you talking about a, another? 200. So the mayor announced 152. There's 200 here and there's 200 that were put through. So that's almost 600. Could you clarify that, please? Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair. For fire, um, they have two classes that are proceeding in 2023. The class that's proceeding, um, I think it starts in January, in actual fact, has 104 recruits. And there is a class that will be moving forward in July, and it will actually be the 52 plus any retirements that are announced between okay. now and then. Thank you, and I'll ask the you. Chief People Officer for all last, of these hirings. What is the? Uh, how are we ensuring that our diversity requirements are being met for the City of Toronto? What's special? How do you manage that for fire, EMS, and police? Uh, uh, through the chair, we can get into that maybe on Thursday. We do have an equity uh, responsive budget uh, briefing note that we can um, bring to you at that time and uh, talk to all of our equity um, and, and diversity initiatives. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Chang. number of how many refugees are being housed outside of the our, our own shelter system so through the chair and just for clarification that's 2500 per night is the average that we're up to now in fact today it's just been up to 2550 uh, I don't have a number that are, sh that are outside of our shelter system. So certainly not all refugees end up in the shelter system. Uh, so that's just to be very clear on that, but it is a significant portion of, 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 of impact for those that are coming through the Toronto area. So I, I think my concern is when we're asking for federal government funding, are we asking for sufficient funding for 2,550 beds per night, or are we asking enough funding to support all the refugees who are arriving in Toronto. So through the chair, our request of the federal government is for impacts to the municipal budget. Um, much of the refugee response is actually funded directly by the federal government to um, uh, refugee support organizations and uh, does not flow through the municipality. So what we're looking at is where is the impact of refugees specific to the municipality that's not covered off in other uh, grant programs and that's the, uh, that's the funding that we'd, uh, we'd be looking at. I, I see the framing of these big gaps for TTC and shelter costs uh, to be around COVID. But I know that, uh, you know, the bed distancing is now being removed. So I think that, you know, and I think a lot of people would say that the growing mental health and addiction crisis is in fact more of the reason for this increase in costs. And so I'm wondering, you know, if we keep framing it as a COVID gap, does that do a disservice to our long-term planning of really addressing what is happening? Because if you talk to someone who works in a shelter, they will say that they are the catch basin for people falling through the gaps. 
and there are many gaps that are increasing. And so in this budget, we're calling it a COVID gap, but is there uh, another way to calculate this that it's actually a, gro a growth that's just out of a systemic failure that is happening? So through the, through the chair, uh, Councillor raises a, a very important point. So for the purpose of the budget presentation, what we're looking at is really the impact that COVID had on the operations of our shelter system. So as you know, uh, Toronto uh, expanded their shelter system very dramatically, very quickly in order to, um, to, to protect health and save lives. That's where we're working through, and that is a COVID reality. Your point is, is very well uh, taken, and in fact, as we get into 2023 and through 2023, exactly what you're talking about is the work that will start to unfold. Two things are at play. There are certain things that COVID-19 uh, exposed and, and, and put us through that will continue beyond it when we, we won't be calling it a COVID-19 impact anymore. And then the second piece is we need to actually uh, do that fulsome review of uh, what is our shelter system, what should it look like, what should it be, how should it respond to the various needs of our community. And that is, uh, as you rightly point out, not just a COVID-19 discussion. So uh, hopefully you can understand our positioning of this within a budget overview for today, but your point is, uh, is very well taken and more will follow on that in 2023. So is there a group of smart people somewhere in the mm -hmm. city who are calculating the cost of this, you know, some people would say this is the picking people who are drowning out of the river, but moving upstream to how do we prevent people from falling into the river? What is the calculation of the cost that needs to be invested upriver so that our downriver costs are not growing exponentially, which it seems that they are growing because huge gaps are happening upstream. Uh, so through the chair, uh, yes, uh, not only uh, folks within, very good folks within the City of Toronto, but working with many of our partners, um, academic and community-based, uh, we're doing much of that work on a regular basis. And one of the most profound areas, as an example I'll use, is around the impacts of supportive housing and just how much more cost-effective it is for all of us, not just looking at it from a City of Toronto lens, but from a provincial and federal lens, as well as just a societal lens, how much more effective and efficient it is for us to provide the right kind of housing with the right supports. And we actually have the cost uh, breakdown of what it is to shelter somebody, uh, which I think we would agree is not the approach we would want long term, as opposed to providing that supportive housing. Much more cost effective to do it the other way. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we just need a quick motion to extend, just uh, finish this round if we can, we're coming to committee. So motion to extend for a few minutes. Approved. You have to finish the meeting. All approved. Carried. Oh, there's a motion. Great. We'll take it into committee, I think, now. Councillor Moyes, did you have a question? Just that. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I only have two questions. And Councillor Perks actually brought up this, one of my two points I wanted to cover. But it's really around retention. And I won't labor the point because I think you did a good job in uh, addressing it. But again, you know, we're hiring. Uh, a lot of people, be it in police, uh, fire, ambulance, um, planning, all city departments. And there is an issue around retention of staff. Even I think in our own HR department, I think there's a, there's a shortage there too. And it's HR that actually hires, help hire all these people. So it's a chicken and an egg situation. And we all know the cost of living here in the city is much higher than outside our, of our uh, city. And so I know, for example, for police, for example, we hire people, we train them, and they go on to other police services because, you know, they, the, the job is a little different than it is in the city of Toronto. So again, uh, that's um, something we need to, to, to be mindful of, I think, um, because there's a, there's a cost there as well. Um, that, that, that is... I'm supposed to ask a question, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to ask a question. I just wanted to put that on the table just so that you know you know how I feel about that. Um, but <laughs> What changes are you prepared to implement to affect the, the, the outcome of this uh, problem we're having? Here we go. Thank you, Councillor Thompson, for helping me out on that. <laughs> 
Through the chair, uh, thank you, Councillor <laughs> Moyes. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach to retention. Uh, um, we have been, we are not unusual in terms of our recruitment and retention challenges. I think it's a global issue. What I'm happy to say is our um, exit um, percentage has gone down from 15 to 11 over the last uh, year, which is a good is a good news story. The other pieces are addressing sort of total compensation, total rewards for people to make sure we're um, paying people properly for what the market uh, bears. And the other piece is um, the city of Toronto is a great place to work and really sort of helping people sort of be part of that culture. It is very different to work for us. Uh, I think than it is to work for other uh, municipalities and regions. So there's a number of things we're working on at, at, a, at a, any given time to ensure we are recruiting the best and retaining the best as well. Okay, thank you. And my final question uh, is around uh, fuel cost. So I know that the city negotiates uh, the cost of fuel, I don't know if it's every year, every couple of years. And I know there's a $900 million increase, I believe, I read somewhere. 900,000, thank you, 900,000. Um, so since we negotiate the fuel cost, is that done yearly or every a couple of years? How, how does that work? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, we have, again, a multi-pronged approach in how we actually purchase our fuel. We diversify how we purchase it. And obviously, given that some of it is diesel, some of it is regular, um, we do have some contracts, which we, in actual fact, do um, longer-term commitments. But there is some fuel that we are buying based on the spot price. So there, there is a diversification because the locking into a long-term price in fuel over the last few years has has seen obviously benefits to locking in but prior to that uh, it did fluctuate substantially okay. thank you that's all thank you any other committee members have questions no. seeing none okay um, we're gonna adjourn for the day um, be prepared for a full day on Thursday uh, just based on the questions we've heard so far today thank you